Okay. Yeah. So, ready when you are, Minji. Uh, I think you want to make an announcement first. Oh, about the uh, schedule? Yes, yeah. that's true. So, um, so there's been a, a small change to the uh, to the schedule to tomorrow's uh, schedule. So um, one of the uh, talks is uh, not happening, unfortunately. That's the the talk on um, lags and uh, traumatic uh, brain injury. That's the the uh, that would have been the fourth talk um, in the second session tomorrow. And because of that, we pushed everything forward. So you pushed the, the keynote, the second keynote um, forward um, by 30 minutes. Um, and then we'll, um, yeah, so we, we end up uh, finishing, I think, 20 minutes uh, early, um, earlier than planned tomorrow. Um, and yeah, that's the, that, that was the kind of schedule change that happened. So uh, the, the program has been, been edited. I'm not sure if it's been changed on the website yet, but if you look at the Google Doc, uh, the program, uh, the Google Doc of the program, um, it should be the most up-to-date version. And uh, besides that, nothing, nothing changes. Cool. Okay. Um, Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the afternoon session of the symposium. Um, my name is Yunji Chong, and uh, I am one of the organizing committee members and uh, moderator of this session. Uh, we had a great meeting this morning, and in the afternoon, uh, I would like to ask the attendees and panelists to be more active, uh, especially the panelists, and you can really jump into any discussion you want, you know, whenever you see fit, just, you know, because you're allowed to speak anytime. So, um, and, um, Without further ado, um, let's welcome our first speaker, Katie Chen. Um, Dr. Katie Chen is assistant professor at Vanderbilt University. She was previously a postdoc at NIH, and her lab focused on methods for ana analyzing and interpreting functional near imaging data. Con uh, current projects include computational analysis of fMRI data, multimodal imaging of dynamic brain states, uh, neural and the physiological basis of fMRI signals, networks, and techniques for improving quantity of fMRI data. Uh, actually, many of us know Katie, so um, let's uh, play her video, and she will be here to answer questions right after the, the video. Here we go. Hi. Um, I'd first like to thank all the organizers for putting this workshop together and for the chance to participate. In this talk, I'll be discussing peripheral physiology and bold fMRI signals. I'm going to discuss some motivation for studying peripheral physiology together with fMRI, um, relationships between some major physiological variables and fMRI signals. Uh, we'll, dis we'll discuss how physiological and neurally driven effects can co-vary in their bold responses. And throughout, I plan to illustrate ways in which physiological effects can be used either as signal or for denoising, depending on the goal of your study. And I believe that uh, many of these ideas will touch on topics that will be expanded upon in later talks in this meeting. So bold fMRI captures dynamic changes in blood oxygenation across the brain, and this allows us to indirectly study neural activity through neurovascular coupling. Um, oftentimes we study the brain in isolation. However, we also know that the brain and body are closely interconnected and continuously influencing each other. Um, so there are autonomic interactions that engage not only the brainstem, but also cortical networks. And we can also get systemic changes in bold signal in the brain that are driven by um, changes in uh, blood pressure, heart rate, and breathing, for example. And um, these effects can modulate fMRI signals in ways that are not directly related to the lo local neural activity in a given region. Um, so it can be very useful to have some indication of the body's physiological state when we are doing fMRI. Uh, so we can measure things like breathing, um, heart rate, skin conductance, and other peripheral signals during the scan. These measures can help us with disentangling various components of the bold signal, and relatedly are very helpful in interpreting ongoing uh, changes in bold, uh, as well as measures that we derive, such as functional connectivity. Um, there's also a growing amount of work showing that physiological state is highly relevant to brain function. So importantly, um, even though physiological recordings are often used for denoising an, an fMRI, um, we don't always just want to discard physiological components as noise. 
So now let's focus in on cardiac and respiratory effects in fMRI. So respiration is often measured with a belt around the subject that expands and contracts during breathing. And EKG or pulse oximetry are common ways of measuring cardiac activity. Um, in a PPG signal, for example, the timing of the pulse waves indicates uh, the timing of heartbeats, and the amplitude of these waves over time also track variations in blood volume, which may be another useful autonomic measure. And there are actually a few distinct ways through which cardiac and respiratory processes influence fMRI. Um, some fMRI effects are synchronized with uh, breathing and cardiac cycles, so each time a breath is taken or each time the heart beats, this can induce a corresponding deflection in fMRI data. Um, but there are also other effects that involve uh, low frequency changes in um, the, the rate and depth of breathing over time or in the heart rate, and these can affect bold signals uh, through different mechanisms. So first, uh, looking at cyclic effects, um, let's visualize these. So here's fMRI data that was collected with a very fast temporal resolution, so 100 milliseconds, at least fast enough to resolve these cycles in the data. So you can see these cardiac um, pulsations as well as some respiratory um, oscillations as well. And um, I think that the mechanisms uh, behind these effects are going to be discussed in more detail um, in other lectures. But just briefly, um, the cardiac cycle can create pulsation of brain, especially around large vessels. Um, and there's also movement of the brainstem, the CSF. And um, for respiration, one of the main effects comes from movement of the abdomen and of the organs in the chest uh, during breathing. So even if your head is still, this movement of the body can cause changes in the static magnetic field of the brain, which can result in um, shifting of your image if you're using an EPI sequence or blurring if you're using spiral. Temporally, these effects happen at the frequencies of the cardiac and respiratory cycles. However, they often appear at lower frequencies in our fMRI data um, when we're undersampling by using TRs like one or two seconds, um, so that's, which is the case for most uh, conventional fMRI acquisitions. So when these cycles are aliased, then they overlap with lower frequency bands that are often studied for um, task activation or resting state uh, uh, spontaneous activity, such as below 0.15 hertz. So, so actually one benefit to collecting fMRI at faster sampling rates is that it can help us resolve these cycles more clearly. However, um, even if uh, you have data where these are aliased, there are still, still ways of trying to identify these effects, um, including uh, retro i -core. In terms of the spatial distribution of these effects, um, cardiac cycle effects tend to be strongest near large arteries, and since respiration can cause shifting or blurring, then this tends to in induce the largest changes around the edges of the brain and boundaries between tissue types. Here you may also notice that there's quite a lot of physiological variance in areas like the insula and the brainstem, so these effects um, may be particularly important to consider when you're studying these brain areas. Um, in addition to looking at which areas are most effective, uh, affected, it's also quite interesting to track the propagation of these um, oscillations across the brain. So here, Tong et al. used a pulse ox signal together with fast multiband fMRI data and showed that you can map the dynamic flow of the cardiac signal throughout the brain. Um, one use of this information can be for denoising. So if you wanted, you could actually try to remove this from the data and see whether you get cleaner resting state networks. Um, however, they also propose that it may be clinically useful, so maybe we can assess abnormalities in the vasculature, or maybe we can look at how these dynamics co-vary with different uh, clinical symptoms. We can also um, imagine trying to examine certain biological processes, um, and in this example, um, uh, lymphatic clearance um, was examined. So it's been suggested that um, cardiovascular pulsations may uh, contribute to driving motion of the CSF um, in supporting waste clearance from the brain. So now let's look at uh, low frequency cardiac and respiratory effects, um, which arise from different mechanisms. So it's been known for a long time that deep breaths and breath holding can alter bold signals across the brain by several percent, in fact, much larger than some changes generated by neural activity. 
Um, these are not caused by motion or pulsation, but instead from changes in um, arterial carbon dioxide concentration um, or blood pressure that are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So uh, carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. Um, it opens blood vessels and increases cerebral blood flow and volume. And so when you're changing how quickly or deeply you're breathing, this changes the concentrations of arterial carbon dioxide, um, which can cause widespread fold signal changes. And importantly, uh, that fold signal change in a region is not directly coupled to um, the local neural activity. But you don't just need uh, deep breaths to get these effects. In fact, natural fluctuations in the depth and rate of breathing over time can modulate fold signal across the brain. So um, these changes are essentially captured, captured in the envelope of the breathing waveform. Um, and you can see that the uh, slower frequencies of these amplitude variations um, very much overlap with the low frequency spectral content of um, neurally driven fold fluctuations. There's also a lot of spatial overlap between RVT effects and neurally driven fold. So RVT is highly correlated with uh, gray matter and, uh, and with the signals of um, and, and, and in, in brain regions that are involved in resting state networks like the default mode network. Um, and because of this kind of spatial and spectral overlap, these uh, low frequency physiological effects tend to be harder to differentiate from neural effects compared to uh, the cyclic cardiac pulsation and respiratory motion um, that we discussed earlier. Um, these studies were quite timely because resting state fMRI was really gaining momentum around this time, and these, these um, studies kind of pointed out that these effects may be pretty critical to consider in the interpretation of functional connectivity and other um, resting state metrics. Another illustration um, of these effects and how they impact fold signal is in this paper from Jonathan Power. So in blue here is the respiration belt signal, and you can see in the subject that there were large variations in the breathing volume. And you can see that there are corresponding deviations um, in the signals across fMRI voxels. So what's shown here is um, each uh, voxel corresponds to a row, um, and that row is uh, the time course of that, of that voxel. Um, and you can also see that in the whole brain average fMRI signal, which is up here. So um, I think that this figure also illustrates the value of recording uh, measures like breathing. So if we did not know about these respiratory changes, then it could be tempting to attribute this to some kind of global brain uh, synchronization event. And indeed, this is actually um, an important consideration when we're starting to move toward um, time resolved or, or dynamic measures of activity and functional connectivity. So if you can imagine like sliding a window of time across your data and looking at how functional connectivity is, is changing over, over time, um, if you have time windows that contain a deep breath, then they may, um, they may manifest in uh, strong correlations across the brain, uh, not necessarily because there's strong uh, cortical, cortical interactions, but rather because of a common effect of respiration across much of the brain. So how exactly can we model the influence of these low frequency uh, breathing effects on the bold signal? Um, it turns out it's not as straightforward as taking a correlation between the two waveforms. Um, and to illustrate this, this is kind of an extreme example, but here's some data from one of my scans um, where I noticed that the subject was taking these deep, uh, sharp, deep breaths. And um, as you can see, um, an increase in the RVT signal doesn't just produce an instantaneous change in fMRI, but instead it, it really shows this delayed negative dip. So it was proposed by uh, Rasmus Byrne that the relationship between RV or RVT as sometimes called and fMRI um, is well modeled by uh, a convolution between RV and a respiration response function that looks like this. Um, and this is kind of similar to the idea of how we would convolve a stimulus um, waveform with a hemodynamic response before regressing it against the bold signal. Um, and indeed, the, the uh, convolution gives a better fit to the data. Uh, a similar notion can be used um, for modeling the effects of heart rate on fMRI. So um, we, we also can derive a cardiac response function. Um, and if we convolve the, the, the slow variations in heart rate over time with this cardiac response function, then that produces a better match to the fMRI signal than if we were to just kind of directly compare the heart rate uh, er, er, itself. So um, overall, um, an important goal has been, you know, how can we find good models that map between these measured physiological signals and fMRI 
Um, and if we can, can succeed in, in producing good models, then we're better able to disentangle specific parts of our fMRI signals that can arise from these various effects. Um, and then we can target those components specifically as either signal or noise rather than mixing those together in our analyses. So um, the response functions that we just looked at um, are modeling a relationship between uh, physiology and fMRI on average, but we might suspect that there can be spatial variation across the brain in terms of how um, a change in, in heart rate or in breathing affects um, fMRI signals. So um, this was a study um, where we examined the structure of these dynamic responses the brain, and the approach we took here, here was to fit um, response functions voxel-wise and then cluster brain areas that share similar responses. And what you can see here is um, in, in the case where we derive four clusters, these clusters tend to follow very organized spatial patterns. Um, they, they even look a little bit like um, resting state networks. But um, down here you can see the, the, the respiration uh, response functions that are associated with these different groups of voxels. Um, we can also kind of repeat this at different granularities of clustering, um, and we also get uh, very reliable uh, responses if we um, compare uh, two, groups of, two groups of subjects, which are the solid and dotted lines here. So um, one thing that this, this set of results suggests is that there may be reliable uh, signatures or reliable dynamics that happen in response to changes in breathing. Um, which differ across different brain regions, and, and therefore maybe the, the, the relationship between respiration and fMRI is, is not well captured by a single um, regressor. Um, and another thing you can see uh, is, is another interesting finding, I think, is the overlap with the resting state networks. And in fact, this kind of observation has been made in other studies as well. So here it was found that uh, bold signals in the brain were closely coupled with the uh, hemodynamic, uh, peripheral hemodynamic responses recorded at the fingertip using optical mirrors. And the timing delays were different across the brain. Um, and you can track these propagating waves um, and notice that it results in highly organized patterns. Um, and you can see different resting state networks um, coming in at different phase lags. So this kind of presents the question of um, whether resting state networks are to some extent driven by um, correlated vascular responses, and the study showed that it was it's possible to rec uh, to recover um, structured resting state networks based purely on the time lags to peripheral hemodynamics. Um, these network structures in simulated data match very well what you get from the actual data. Um, but I think that, importantly, uh, the findings of the, the, the last few studies I showed uh, don't suggest that resting state networks are 100% vascular. So uh, there's actually a lot of evidence that there is a neural component to resting state networks, um, including work in uh, using intracranial electrophysiology. Um, but rather, they may be both neural and vascular contribution to these structured patterns. So um, this study uh, presented um, cognitive and sensory tasks uh, to evoke neural activity. Um, and in the same scan, the subject um, also was breathing a, a CO2 uh, to, to evoke vascular response, um, but with a different time course than, the, the act, the, than that of the task. And, and when, when they analyzed the data, uh, they found it was possible to identify uh, pairs of networks that are spatially very similar to one another, but temporally distinct, with one of them tracking the ta task of design and the other one tracking the vascular response. And so what this suggested is that it's perhaps, um, a, perhaps a very interesting and beneficial thing uh, for the brain to have an alignment um, between vascular networks and neuronal networks. Um, now, in that case, the neural and vascular responses were distinct from one another by design, but it, it is also quite common to have temporal co-variation between neural and physiological responses. Um, so in some tasks um, that emo use emotional or startling stimuli um, and, and, and some cognitive tasks, uh, you can actually see task-correlated um, changes in breathing and in heart rate, for example. So these shaded blocks are like blocks when a subject was doing a, a decision-making task. Um, and you can also see these kinds of uh, neural and physiological covariations in resting state too. Um, and one way to look at that is by correlating peripheral physiology with a measure of the brain's electrical acti activity, uh, like EEG, um, which was done um, here in, in Gene Chen's lab. 
And one kind of event um, that contains both neural and vascular responses happens during sleep. Um, so this was data from a combined fMRI and EEG scan during sleep. Um, we also monitored pulse ox at the fingertip, um, where, where the amplitude of the PPG signal uh, provides a measure of blood volume at the fingertip. And one thing that we noticed in this data was that in light sleep, um, when you get K-complexes in the EEG, this came together with pronounced drops in the fingertip blood volume signal. Um, and K-complexes have been known to come with an autonomic arousal, so the dip is actually likely capturing um, vasoconstriction caused by sympathetic nervous system response. Um, and if we look at the bold fMRI signal that's locked to these events, um, what we see is, is around the time of this event, we get a large decrease in gray matter bold signal, um, along with a corresponding increase in white matter and CSF signals. So um, what, is the, you know, what is the origin of these uh, global um, changes in, in bold? Well, given that there's an EEG correlate, um, part of it could certainly be of neural origin. Um, but, but since there's also an autonomic response, um, that can be causing um, brain vascular changes, um, in particular since the peel vasculature is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and this constriction of peel vessels may lead to, to, to widespread bold signal changes. Um, this study and related work uh, is, is also um, starting to indicate that this mechanism may also be present during wake um, at a resting state, and we've also been uh, looking at tasks. So I think this is another example in which um, peripheral recordings can, can definitely be helpful for um, uncovering various mechanisms of bold fluctuation, um, and also overall like reminds us of how closely connected uh, the brain and body are. In fact, although I've mainly focused on how physiological changes generate um, non-neural vascular responses in fMRI, it's important to keep in mind that the brain is involved in the modulation of physiological processes to begin with. So this is a nice figure from a review article by Tom Liu that illustrates how uh, breathing and cardiac and even head motion um, are, are, you know, can arise in the first place from brain activity um, and also shows some of the pathways by which physiological processes um, can then in turn, again, impact fMRI signals. So peripheral recordings are very useful, um, but oftentimes we don't have them available during our scans, um, or sometimes they are, uh, but many of these recordings can be really noisy, so we're not really able to effectively use them. So one direction in the literature has been to start looking at whether it's possible to extract physiological um, information in a data-driven manner from the fMRI data itself. Um, and then we can use that resulting information as you know, for denoising or for, for, for sources of, of information about um, brain-body interactions. Um, several previous studies have focused on reconstructing um, cyclic uh, respiratory and cardiac effects using slice timing differences, um, you know, between uh, slices um, or, uh, or fast fMRI acquisitions. Um, and in a complementary line of work, here we were looking at whether we can decode uh, directly the low frequency respiratory and heart rate uh, variations from fMRI data. So in other words, can we take a bold fMRI data set as input and can we output a continuous prediction of respiratory volume and heart rate that would match what we would, could derive from recorded uh, peripheral data? Um, this is work by Jorge and Rosa in our lab. So our initial studies use uh, linear uh, models and convolutional neural networks, um, and these are various single subject examples of um, predicted versus um, recorded um, low frequency respiratory variation. And more recently, we've turned to other deep learning architectures and are also trying to see um, if models trained on resting state data can generalize to other task conditions. Um, and here we were using HCP data. So we hope that uh, this kind of work can be used to enrich um, the many existing data sets that lack physiological recordings um, and, and provide useful information about dynamic physiological states. So I've shown um, a number of examples so far of how peripheral measures can be used as signal, not just as noise. Um, this is another one that points to um, interesting links with emotion and personality traits. So here it was found that low frequency fluctuations in pulse amplitude preceded some low frequency fluctuations in resting state networks, and that the amount of synchrony between these peripheral autonomic measures and brain networks 
um, was associated with more positive personality and emotional um, characteristics. So the brain-body covariation may be um, something else we can look to as uh, for, for important markers of individual differences in behavior. So I think that some of the main uh, take-home points here are that, um, firstly, the combination of peripheral physiology and fMRI can be a valuable source of information, such as for the study of brain physiology um, and brain-body interactions, um, and in both health and disease. And given that there are many complex interactions between peripheral physiology and vol de fMRI, um, recording physio data and developing good models for the effects can help us to better interpret ongoing fMRI signals and ultimately lead to clear inferences in our studies. Um, and finally, the brain and body are so closely con connected and it's becoming more clear that we should study the brain in the context of physiological states and, and look at those interactions. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Katie. Um, okay, so we do have some questions. Um, first, a question from attendees, and uh, which is basic question. If in a design we had a baseline and we always contrast, we always contrasted against this baseline, would the physiological signal still be an issue? Or is this more a resting state for my experiment related issue? Yeah, well, um... I think that unfortunately, even during tasks, um, you can get a lot of uh, co-variation between your um, physiological responses and the task design. So even if you, so I've seen some people get out like breathe in, in basically a block design that's following the task. And it's very interesting because you wouldn't expect that like some tasks might cause a physiological response. Um, we even had a task recently that was like a tiny tone uh, presented every once in a while and you got a really reliable, um, cardiac deflection, you know, like respiratory, like, like deep breath. Um, and so, yeah, if you were to do an event related response, um, we would still see that. So I think that it is important in task data as well, although it's not as widely, um, I, I think considered in, in task data, and maybe just because it kind of like became a thing people started to use um, more in resting state, like adding physiological regressors, but I think definitely um, interesting for tasks as well. Uh, we have another question, uh, actually it's from uh, Ahmed. Um, is the distribution of a uh, cyclical uh, cardiac, cardiac, uh, cardiac, cardiac activity, I cannot speak this afternoon, <laughs> in the insular related to the insular's close proximity to large arteries uh, such as MCA, or is the signal actually coming from insular parenchyma? Well, I think that um, it's an interesting question because there can definitely just be, um, a, a, it can definitely just be related to um, being near arteries. Um, but of course, like because the insula is also involved in autonomic regulation and salience, um, then there could actually be, you know, some, some neural effects linked with um, cardiac as well. Um, now, how much that plays into the, the rhythmic cardiac cycle, um, I'm not sure actually, but um, maybe more for like changes in heart rate over time, I would maybe speculate. Although if anyone else has uh, thoughts on that, I'd be interested to hear. Yeah, as I said, you know, the, uh, any panelist wants to jump in, feel free to, to unmute yourself and start talking. Uh, actually, follow this question. I do have a, a, another question from um, myself. You know, for example, we do have a neuronal activation, right? So in resting state or in task, right? So all I'm thinking is, if you have this neuronal activation in the brain that, that triggers some physiological changes, that can feed back to your ball signal again. So, so in, in, in the first sense, you do have a very regional activation. While because this activation generates global physiology changes, right? You, you, you know this very well. Then this also gonna come back to affect your, your ball signals. And if the delay between these two signals is very small, that, that could be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that I think makes the interpretation uh, tricky whenever there is um, something going on where you have a close temporal covariation between these signals. Now, sometimes there's um, we would expect a little bit of a difference in the time lag. I think like um, the response to a deep breath has different temporal dynamics than you would see in a normal like HRF, I guess, which a neural neurally related HRF would be more more quick, I think. So um, there is some kinds of separation we can do based on the temporal dynamics. but not always it's like <laughs> it can be pretty tricky <laughs> you know. yeah okay we'll have another question uh thanks for a great talk how much do the topology and the temporal dynamics of the vasculature related to structural or functional connectivity 
For example, do anatomical connected brain region tend to receive blood oxygen at more similar time than anatomically disconnected ones? Yeah, so um, I'll, I will probably, I'll give a tentative response, but I think that um, people who are more familiar with vascular anatomy should definitely weigh into this question. So, cause I'm not familiar with like how all the structural connections align with the, um, the vascular anatomy, but for in terms of functional connectivity um, in our study and in, in, in your studies as well, um, several others that we show, um, there's interesting uh, alignment between the, at least um, respiratory um, responses or the slow hemodynamic responses and um, uh, resting state um, networks. And um, I think that uh, also Molly's study that I mentioned uh, points to like very, yeah, very interesting uh, connection in the, in the spatial distribution of these patterns that may be a uh, useful uh, biological property um, of brain. So. Okay, so I have another question. Thank you for the great talk. Does brain periphery synchrony tell us something in addition to or different from the correlation between both and the personality emotion measures? Is this something that we need to be mindful of or always something to correct? Um, well, there I think that um, it's not necessarily that uh, we need to correct for it. I think that it's an interesting avenue of um, investigation to see whether these brain body synchrony measures actually do have a relation to some kind of personality trait. Um, and so I think that I mean, it depends on what kind of brain periphery synchrony you're talking about here. I think um, in that study, they were looking specifically at the amplitude of the pulse um, waves that relates to sympathetic um, activity. Um, but of course, there's a variety of other um, peripheral measures that correlate with both and may be more or less relevant to the um, personality or emotion measures. Okay, I think we can have a uh, fitting two more questions. Um, I think we might want to move on. Oh, okay, it's about time. Okay, so Leah is our uh, time. We can maybe so, um, go back in the discussion. We have written uh, down all the questions. Yeah, as Ahmed mentioned this morning, and all the questions hopefully will be addressed by our speakers. We will forward these questions to the speaker and we will publish the, their answers to the website or you will get an email uh, about their answers to these questions. Uh, thanks, Katie. We're going to move on. And our uh, next speaker is uh, Tom Liu. And uh, just give me one second. Um, so many, many persons know Tom, and uh, Dr. Tom Liu is director of UCSD Center for Functional MRI and a professor in UCSD uh, Department of Radiology. His research has spanned a broad range of fMRI-related research areas, including experimental design, analysis, innovative signal processing approaches, characterization, and modeling of the fMRI signal multimodal imaging of the brain activity and development of advanced imaging methods and their applications. Okay, so without further ado, then let, let's have the recording of Tom. This talk is part of the Noises Signal Finding Chemo Symposium. I'll be going over some basic concepts on the biophysical basis of FRI noise that I hope you will find useful as background for the subsequent lectures in the symposium. Since the first demonstration in humans in 1992, fMRI has become the predominant approach for the non-invasive characterization of brain activity. Within a year of these initial studies, Weisskopf and colleagues pointed out in 1993 that noise-like components in the fMRI signal were partly due to physiological sources, in particular, strong fluctuations related to cardiac pulsations. Building upon that initial observation, the characterization of fMRI noise has greatly expanded and continues this to this day as an active area of research. In this talk, I will review a number of key concepts that are important for understanding the mechanisms underlying fMRI noise. We will start by reviewing some basic characteristics of the bold signal. In fMRI studies, we are typically interested in variations in the bold signal reference to some baseline condition. Shown here in green, we have the baseline signal decaying with an effective transverse relaxation rate of R2 star B and measured at echo time TE. In the activation signal shown in red, the relaxation rate R2 star A has decreased such that the signal at echo time TE has increased. If we look at the normalized change in the bold signal, we will find that the first order, it is the product of the echo time and the change in R2 star. 
In the next few slides, we'll take a closer look at the factors that contribute to R2 star. To understand R2 star in the context of fMRI, it's useful to recall that each hemoglobin molecule contains four heme groups, each of which has an iron atom. In the lungs, oxygen binds to these iron atoms, shielding them from the surrounding environment. In the brain, as oxygen is released to support cerebral metabolism, the iron atoms are exposed, and the resulting form is referred to as deoxyhemoglobin. The exposed iron atoms perturb the local magnetic environment, causing spins to process at different frequencies and dephase over time. This dephasing leads to decay in the transverse MRI signal. As a result, the effective transverse relaxation rate is proportional to the total amount of deoxyhemoglobin. This in turn is proportional to cerebral blood volume and the concentration of deoxyhemoglobin raised to a power of approximately 1.5. The concentration of venous deoxyhemoglobin is given by the ratio of CMRO2, which is the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, and CBF, which is cerebral blood flow. An increase in CBF carries more oxygen to the capillary beds, and thus will tend to decrease the deoxyhemoglobin concentration. In contrast, an increase in CMR2 means that more oxygen is being used by the brain, and therefore, the deoxyhemoglobin concentration will increase. Putting all the elements together, we have that R2 star due to deoxyhemoglobin is proportional to the cerebral blood volume, and the ratio of CMR2 and CBF raised to the power beta. Although understanding is still incomplete, the current working picture is that changes in neuroactivity lead to changes in both CMRO2 and CBF. In addition, changes in CMRO2 may also trigger changes in CBF. Changes in CBF lead to changes in CBE, and the change in the total amount of deoxyhemoglobin depends on all three quantities. The resultant changes in R2 star then give rise to the bold signal change. Now that we've reviewed the factors that contribute to R2 star, we will take another look at the bold signal equation. In this first equation, we have the transverse relaxation term as before, but have added an initial transverse magnetization S0 of t and an additive background noise N of t. S0 of t represents the transverse magnetization that is present at t equals zero before any relaxation has occurred. We can make a first order approximation of the bold signal change in terms of the change in the magnetization term and the change in R2 star. Normalizing this by a baseline value gives rise to an expression that depends on time varying changes in both a normalized magnetization term and a relaxation term that is proportional to delta R2 star. Now we will provide an overview of the factors that can give rise to noise like fluctuations in both the magnetization and relaxation terms. Fluctuations in the magnetization term reflect temporal changes in measurements of the initial transverse magnetization at each location. This in turn reflects changes in local proton density and spin history effects, as well as susceptibility induced distortions. Sources of variability include MRI system instabilities, subject motion, cardiac pulsations, respiratory activity, and inflow effects. On the other hand, fluctuations in the relaxation term reflect variations in R2 star and can thus be affected by factors that modulate CBB, CBF, and CMRO2. These include modulation of CBF by respiratory activity, modulation of CBB, CBF, and CMRO2 by cardiac activity, and variability in all three quantities related to variations in blood pressure and intrinsic fluctuations in neural activity. Finally, note that the relaxation term exhibits a dependence on echo time TE, whereas the magnetization term does not. We will examine this further in the next slide. Here we take a closer look at the difference between the magnetization and relaxation terms. In this figure, all signals are plotted as a function of echo time TE. If we compare the magnetization related signals in the baseline activation states, we see that the starting point changes, but the time constant of the exponential decay remains the same. As a result, the difference between the activation and baseline signals exhibits exponential decay for the same time constant. Normalizing this difference by the baseline signal leads to computing the ratio of two exponential decay curves with the same time constant. This ratio is independent of echo time. On the other hand, if we compare the relaxation-related signals in the baseline and activation states, 
we see that the starting point remains the same, but the time constant of exponential decay increases when moving from baseline to activation state. As a result, the difference between the activation and baseline states no longer exhibits a simple exponential decay, and the normalized difference is proportional to equitime TE. As we'll discuss in the next slide, this difference in the dependence on echo time affords us the opportunity to differentiate between the magnetization and relaxation terms. An integrated framework for differentiating the magnetization and relaxation terms was introduced by Kundu and colleagues in 2012. It is based on the acquisition of multi-echo EVI images. In this example, images are acquired at echo times of 15, 39, and 63 milliseconds with the corresponding time courses shown in red, green, and blue, respectively, for a task-related fMRI signal from the visual area B1 shown in row B and resting state fMRI signal from precunia shown in row C. The normalized changes in the signals from both ROIs exhibit a linear dependence on echo time, indicating that they represent bold-related relaxation terms. The processing model involves the first step of dimensionality reduction with PCA, followed by separation into independent components with ICA. The equitime dependence of the independent components is then examined. Components that exhibit a linear dependence on TE are classified as bold-like relaxation terms, whereas components that are relatively independent of TE are classified as non-bold magnetization terms. For components where the distinction based on echo time dependence alone is not clear, additional criteria are needed. In the following slides, we'll make use of this approach to help determine whether an fMRI noise source reflects changes in the magnetization term versus changes in the relaxation term. Subject motion is one of the primary sources of noise in fMRI time series. Although the use of image registration methods is a standard pre-processing step, it is long to observe that residual artifacts remain even after the application of image registration. These residual artifacts reflect limitations in the ability to rely on images, especially in the presence of large movements, spin history effects, and time varying image distortion due to motion through inhomogeneous magnetic fields. These effects are expected to primarily manifest as changes in the magnetization term. The top row here shows the motion traces from a subject with relatively little motion on the left and one with a substantial motion on the right. Summary motion metrics, FD and D bars, are shown in the second and third rows, where the vertical scales on the right span a much greater range to account for the increased motion. In the bottom row, the multi-echo ICA approach was used to compute the D bars metrics associated with relaxation terms, indicated as high kappa, and magnetization terms indicated as low kappa. The magnetization terms show much greater agreement with the motion seen in the raw data, supporting our expectation that motion primarily affects the magnetization term. Multiband acquisitions are now a standard part of many fMRI protocols, and offer higher temporal resolution as compared to single band acquisitions. However, they may exhibit increased motion sensitivity due to the aggressive use of parallel imaging, as well as greater spin history effects with the shorter TRs that are used. These are some examples of multiband artifacts that were first identified with ICA applied to single echo multiband EPI acquisitions. In later work, Olofsson and others used multi echo multiband EPI acquisitions and the multi echo ICA approach to show that these multiband artifacts primarily reflect perturbations of the magnetization term. Even a casual inspection of fMRI data quickly reveals the widespread presence of low frequency drifts in the data. The nature of these drifts can vary considerably even between neighboring voxels. Although the mechanisms are not fully understood, potential sources include MRI system drifts, slowly varying displacement of the head, and low frequency changes in physiology. Using the multi echo ICA approach, Evans and colleagues were able to provide evidence suggesting that a significant portion of low frequency drifts can be attributed to changes in the non bold magnetization term. However, Yan and colleagues have shown that the relative magnitude of drifts in the 0.0 to 0.01 Hz range exhibit a bold like dependence on echo time. Thus, drifts most likely reflect the effects on both the magnetization and relaxation terms. The identification of cardiac pulsation effects in fMRI 
dates back to the early work of Weisskopf and others in 1993. Later work demonstrated a clear relationship between fMRI signal intensity and cardiac phase, and showed that the effects were largely localized with large vessels, ventricles, sulci, and the edges of the brain. The induced signal changes are thought to reflect dynamic changes in the relative distribution of brain tissue, blood, and cerebral spinal fluid. In addition, there may be inflow effects, especially with short TR acquisitions. Taking these factors into account, we would expect that the effects should primarily affect the magnetization term. This is supported by a multi-echo IC example from Malofs and others, showing a non-bold magnetization component that most likely reflects pulsations in the sagittal sinus. Another type of magnetization term artifact occurs from an interesting interaction between respiration and the EPI image acquisition process. When we breathe in and out, the volume of air in our thoracic cavity changes, and this causes time-varying perturbations of the magnetic field. These magnetic field changes lead to changes in the frequency of precession of spins in the brain. For an EPI acquisition, these frequency changes manifest as shifts in shading of the image that are most pronounced along the phase encode direction. In this figure from Raj and others, we can see that the center of mass of the image exhibits large fluctuations along the phase encode direction that occur at the respiratory frequency, whereas fluctuations along the readout direction are much smaller. Recently, it has been shown that respiratory-induced artifacts can lead to spurious increases in motion metrics, such as FD, that are commonly used to assess scan quality and guide image censoring approaches. Now I'd like to transition to factors that primarily affect the relaxation term. With variation in the breathing, carbon dioxide levels can fluctuate considerably over the course of an fMRI scan. Wise and colleagues demonstrate that the fluctuations in entitled CO2 were strongly correlated with fluctuations in the bold signal across multiple brain regions. As carbon dioxide is a potent vasodilator, it's thought that fluctuations in CO2 lead to fluctuations in cerebral blood flow, which in turn modulate levels of deoxyhemoglobin and the bold signal. Thus, the observed changes are thought to act primarily through the relaxation term. Because of the additional equipment and setup that is required, most fMRI studies do not monitor entitled CO2 levels. However, it is fairly straightforward to monitor respiratory activity with equipment and software that is standard on most MRI systems. Using a measure of respiratory activity referred to as respiration volume per time, or RVT, Byrne and colleagues found that the depth of inspiration, indicated here by the blue envelope, was related to fluctuations in the bold signal. The fluctuations are considerably reduced when the subject is asked to maintain a relatively constant depth of inspiration. In subsequent work, Byrne and others went on to demonstrate that the fit between RBT and the bold signal is greatly improved when the RBT signal is involved with the respiration response function, which is obtained as the average response with single deep breath. Chang and Glover later demonstrated that the filtered RBT signal is strongly coordinated with measures of entitled CO2 indicating that a significant portion of the respiratory effect is mediated through its effects on CO2. In addition, other mechanisms reflecting respiration-related change in thoracic pressure and baroreceptor regulation may also modulate CBF and give rise to changes in the bold signal. Up to now, we have focused on a picture in which respiratory-related changes are considered to be the primary driver of the associated bold signal changes. However, a study by Yuan and others suggests that additional explanations may need to be considered. In this study, the authors used simultaneous EG fMRI measures to assess the dynamic relationship between global field power, referred to as GFP, RVT, and bold fluctuations. They found that GFP and RVT were significantly correlated, and that the changes in GFP led to changes in RVT. Time lag versions of GFP and RBT were both correlated with the bold signal across multiple brain regions. Interestingly, the authors found that the effects were significant when the subjects had their eyes closed, but not when the subjects had their eyes open. These findings suggest that under some conditions, the fluctuations thought to be due to respiratory activity may actually reflect underlying neural activity that drives both respiratory activity and bold signal fluctuations. The need to reconsider the neuronal causes of artifacts is also pointed out in a study by Zhang and others, where they compared a group of subjects who exhibited low average motion to a group with high average motion. After censoring time points such that both groups exhibited the same average levels of motion, 
they found that the high motion group exhibited greater functional connectivity between nodes of the default mode network. In contrast, there was no difference in functional connectivity in comparing data from low motion and high motion sessions of subjects scanned twice on separate days. These findings suggest that there may be neuronal precursors to motion that may be obscured when motion-related bull signal changes are simply considered to be confounds. A phenomenon that is receiving increased attention is the presence of globally coordinated activity across the brain. This can be readily observed in fMRI data, as shown by the dynamic and spatially widespread positive and negative signal levels seen in these images of a single slice of fMRI data across 45 time points. Similar phenomenon can be observed using other modalities, such as this example obtained with optical imaging of neuronal calcium signals in a transgenic mouse model. In fMRI, global activity is often summarized with what is referred to as the global signal, which is computed as the mean of all the signals in the brain. It has been shown that this global signal is highly correlated with the bold signals measured in the large draining veins, as well as measures of peripheral oxygenation obtained from the fingertip. In particular relevance to this symposium, the timing lag structure of the global signal exhibits a high degree of spatial structure. For the most part, the global signal has been treated as a confound especially in resting state fMRI studies, and is regressed out using a procedure known as global signal regression prior to the computation of functional connectivity maps. The presence of the global signal can often obscure the underlying information in functional connectivity maps obtained with minimal preprocessing, and the application of the global signal regression has shown to be very effective for revealing the underlying connectivity structure. However, the use of global signal regression is controversial as it has the potential to introduce negative correlations in addition, there's growing evidence that suggests that the global signal contains useful information. For example, simultaneous EEG fMRI studies have shown that the global signal is negatively correlated with the EEG measures of vigilance. Global activity tends to be high when vigilance is low, and tends to be low when vigilance is high. Thus, pre-processing methods such as global signal regression may be removing the effects of vigilance fluctuations from the data. In this talk, we've considered a number of sources of noise in fMRI. We have reviewed how the fMRI signal can be viewed as a sum of a magnetization term and a relaxation term. Potential sources can modulate one or both of these terms. For example, respiratory activity affects the magnetization term by perturbation of the magnetic field and may affect the relaxation term through a number of physiological mechanisms, including modulation of carbon dioxide levels. While it's common to treat the effects of potential noise sources as confound analysis of fMRI data, there is a growing appreciation that many of the noise-like signals that have traditionally been treated as confounds may, in fact, carry useful information. The challenge in distinguishing information of interest from noise stems from the fact that many noise sources, such as motion, respiration, and cardiac activity, ultimately have their origins in the brain networks that control these functions. Minimizing the contributions of potential noise sources therefore risks removing potentially useful information about brain activity. As fMRI continues to evolve, it will be important for the field to remain mindful of this issue and develop new analysis approaches that more effectively consider the integrated nature of signal and noise in fMRI. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have uh, several questions. Before that, I want to mention this. Uh, how about, let me to, uh, want me to <laughs> remind everybody we will have a live discussion at the end of the uh, my talk. You know, um, I will give the last talk. So at the end of my talk, we'll have a live discussion. So, you know, we were gonna we're gonna address address your question again. You can ask your question again. So don't leave, and you know, we'll have live discussion. So that's just. Uh, um, so the first question uh, came from Ben. Given Phoebe Chan's results, should we not? be measuring expired O2 as well as expired CO2. A nasal cannula isn't terribly invasive, but one does still need breathing gas apparatus, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, I mean, we should probably be measuring a lot more than we are measuring. I mean, so but the, the O2 results are really very striking and we're gonna have to understand that some more. Um, and I mean, I think getting a little, maybe to what Katie was referring to in terms of the body-mind integration. I mean, I think 
the general problem with MRI is, you know, we measure the brain, but the brain is there to control the body. And, you know, we measure things like respiration and cardiac, but there's all these micro motions that go on that are probably incredibly important. Um, it's becoming known in the animal literature, you know, when, when you look at resting state fluctuations, primarily it's driven by all these like little micro motions, right? That the animals are doing and, and humans in a scanner are probably doing the same thing. So I, I do think that if, if possible, we should just be measuring a lot more of the, what the body is doing. Um, I do have another question for myself. Um, Tom, so I'm very interested in the, the breathing, you know, the magnetization effect of breathing, right? So does that have any special patterns on your brain though? Um, well, the, the literature tends to show that it's, it's you know, that, that effect tends to be mostly edge related because of the, the effect on the you know, image distortion. Um, and, but there can be subtle shading effects as well because depending on what the B-naught looks like. I mean, it can both distort and, and cause image uh, shading effects. So I think it probably varies a lot from subject to subject and even scan to scan, as you might guess. It, it's something that I, I don't, I'm not aware of. I mean, it, it could probably be studied more like all of these things, but um, to first order that, that would be the main effects. So Ben, Ben Reese, his hand. So go ahead, Ben. Uh, so Tom, we've got Toshihiko on. So um, he's shown that uh, you have a non-stationary uh, arterial saturation, right? We probably hover around 98% plus minus, but that plus minus can be really important. Um, so I'm curious uh, from either Toshihiko or, or Tom, do you think that that might be the explanation for the, the, the power in, in Phoebe's results, that the, the entitled O2 or the difference in O2, the extraction was, was arguably more powerful than, than the CO2? Um, I, I don't have any data like that, so I, I can't say, say how much that would affect. So I, I would defer to someone who actually has that data to, to speak on that. I'm seeing a, a no from Dr. Abe. <laughs> <Asso, so. laughs> okay. right. well, so uh, it's a good, a, good, a good project for someone to pursue that. Right, yeah, it's fascinating. So, okay, then another general question, if we have another, no others, um, blood pressure and autoregulation. Um, a few of us have tried and failed. Uh, maybe other people are trying and with more success. Um, how important is it? I'll put Molly on the spot, perhaps, or somebody on the spot. Uh, if Do we need this real time? And if we do, or, if, or pseudo real time. And if we do, what's our minimum uh, temporal resolution specification? Um, so I'll let I'll, I'll, Dr. Bright, Molly, if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Speak to um, I mean, in terms of resolution, I think I'd be happy if we had beat to beat blood pressure. Understanding is that's out there that would be MRI compatible. It's not actually getting at blood pressure. It's it's um it's still a bit of a surrogate. So you know, with that, if that was overcome and it was an accessible purchase, then yeah, it'd be great. It would add it to the long laundry list of things that would be good to collect and understand. Um, I don't know exactly how it stacks up in terms of everything else that I think we want to measure and want to push for better measurements of. Um, but certainly it's, it's on the horizon. Um, I forget the name of this, the caretaker, I think it was called. I think these systems do exist. So it is possible to get beat to beat surrogates of blood pressure and look at the relationships with bold for sure. But then Yunji, let me put you on the spot. So uh, uh, what about using, using plethysmography, uh, maybe two um, sensors and, and try and measure the pulse wave velocity at two different points, maybe even with functional nears. We don't necessarily need an absolute measure, a relative measure of change would work, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So that, to me, that's still a mystery, right? So the, in terms of like how the thing propagates through our peripheries, like the fingers and toes, um, you know, because that's you know, the delay is very robust and uh, we, you know, um, we do not fully understand, you know, how 
Exactly, because whatever change in the brain doesn't mean you will you get a similar change in the, in the fingertip. They have high, high, high correlations, but they're not exactly the same. So we're still trying to tease out like what make the per, you know, periphery changes while your brain does change and what make both changes. So it's kind of like a complicated thing. Um, but you, you're absolutely right. So I think it's very closely related to blood pressure, but we do not have this kind of a, a bit-to-bit um, uh, measurement. So we, yeah. Blaze has that, something to want to say, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there have been some recent papers, um, mostly in conferences, but I think I saw one um, peer-reviewed, uh, extracting instantaneous blood pressure out of um, plethysmography um, pulse shape. Um, so you, they, they trained... Um, uh, they trained some neural networks on some, you know, plethysmograms taken from people in ICUs, uh, along with continuous blood pressure measurements, and they were able to get uh, fairly good agreement, uh, you know, fairly good predictive power. I don't know if anybody's validated that in a magnet or, you know, with, with a, a broader population yet, though. There are a couple of comments from Jonathan and Cesar about this and uh, on the chat box, Yunji. <clears throat> Maybe Actually, it can um, be a further question to the discussion in the end. And yeah, we're going to we're going to uh, talk more in the in the discussion at the end. So um, let's just uh, move on. And please type in your questions, you know, um, we'll collect them all. So our next speaker is Ben Inglis and uh, Dr. Ben Inglis is the manager and the physicist at the uh, Henry H. Wheeler Junior Brain Imaging Center and the scientific director of uh, Wheeler Lab for Advanced Brain Science at uh, UC Berkeley. Originally trained in the chemistry, he moved to NMR imaging and uh, spectroscopy during his PhD at the University of London. In 1990s, he was involved in some early work on DTI while at the University of Florida. He has been at Berkeley since 2001, working as an application scientist on a variety of methods related to functional MRI his main research interests are in methods for assessing neurological conditions, including traumatic brain injury, stroke, uh, epilepsy, and uh, Alzheimer's disease. He occasionally blog under the pseudonym Practical FMI. Uh, this is how I knew Ben in the first place. So um, Ben, please. So, uh... A lot of the, the subject matter in my talk today is actually relatively uh, old work, stuff that's been in the literature for um, at least um, what, 20 years, uh, some, some of it as old as the first couple of years of fMRI. Uh, and this is one new result I want to show, but it's all using old concepts. The, uh, the bold that you're familiar with, mostly familiar with, I'm sure, is the dilution model, so driven by cerebral blood flow in response to neurovascular activity. Uh, and then there's a, a second uh, bold effect, which is less well known, which is um, in the arterioles and in the small arteries, uh, which also results from uh, magnetic susceptibility, but it's on the, uh, it's simply a virtue of the, of the, the small blood vessels dilating. Um, and it's it's a it's a weaker effect than the dilution model, but it is it is present in the in the uh, in the data. Then there's also a perfusion-like effect, an inflow effect, or a time of flight effect, which is uh, manifests through T1. So whereas the first two uh, types of bold are T2 and T2 star effects, there's also a T1 change that uh, you should be aware of in fMRI and that we can exploit in uh, lag mapping if, if we so choose. Um, now, for the next couple of slides, I'm going to use some excellent diagrams that I've taken from this paper, the Gao and Lu re review of inflow effects. They were there at the beginning of, of the uh, inflow phenomenon for fMRI. This entire journal is worth reading, uh, this special issue. Uh, it has a lot of very good historical papers in it. And uh, it's, it's a good starting point, I think, for anyone coming into the field um, anew. I think that most of the uh, physiology and physics has not changed that much in the last 10 years. So I think you, you, it's worth going back to that. Um, this is a, a figure from the, the Gal and Lou paper. And uh, just on the left-hand side, I'm sh showing you that the, uh, none of this stuff is particularly new. It was, it's as old as many of the NMR methods themselves, and it was first observed even for, in blood flow as early as the late 1950s. 
In terms of fMRI, uh, the info phenomenon was characterized uh, by Jeff Dunn and uh, Jens Fram in the early 90s. Uh, right at the same time as perfusion uh, development, ASL methods were being developed. So uh, these all happened in, in, in synchrony. So what are we talking about? Well, in the case where there's no flow, so this is a static vessel, the, the blood flow you have to imagine has been turned off. And um, when we achieve a, a steady state, if we uh, apply a train of, of uh, slice selective RF pulses, then the signal we get back will be the steady state with respect to the true T1 of the tissue in the slab, in the slice, and the true blood T1, because the blood is static. But if we now turn the flow on, we get an interesting phenomenon. We don't have to wait for the blood to fully relax with its uh, true T1 constant. Uh, uh, instead, we get a, an effective T1 because fresh spins can come in from the outside of the slice, displacing the, uh, the previously excited spins and give the apparent effect of relaxation. So the signal would get brighter because uh, these new spins are coming in. Now, of course, in this simple cartoon, it's a single slice. We're assuming we're doing nothing either to the left and to the right of the slice. In a real fMRI experiment, generally we're doing multiple slices and the system is much more complicated. Any spatial as well as temporal parameter will tend to affect what we see in terms of inflow. So the slice thickness, uh, the distance between slices, obviously the orientation of the slice with respect to vessels, all of these, uh, and of course the blood flow, the velocity V, all of these uh, come into play uh, in determining what we will see at any point in an image as a result of inflow. Um, this work was, I think, published originally in 2008, and there were probably examples from before that, uh, but this was uh, just an image I grabbed from the Gao Lu uh, review article. And you'll see that in a, a fairly boring, typical uh, uh, visual stimulation experiment, pretty, pretty common uh, back in the early days of fMRI, there are a few different uh, big differences that we can see simply by virtue of changing the excitation flip angle. All the other parameters are held constant. First of all, we see that the blob size gets a little bit bigger as we go from 30 to 60 to 90 degrees. Uh, and that's because uh, two things are happening. If we look at panel D, uh, two things are happening in synchrony. In the first instance, the large flip angles, where by large, I mean at the Ernst angle or greater, uh, you'll see a, a bigger peak in, the, bold, in the, uh, the, the response, I won't call it bold response because it's bold plus inflow. And also the, uh, the time to that peak is a little bit earlier than in a low flip angle case, about about half a second to a second earlier. And that's because the low flip angle case is essentially uh, pure bold weighted. So it's mostly Venus straining vein T2 star contrast. Whereas when we turn up the flip angle at or above the, the Ernst angle, we start to introduce a much more arterial characteristic into the activation map at the same time. So we have arterial plus venous uh, character in this, uh, in this representation. And because the arterial blood responds more quickly earlier than the dilution of the venous deoxyhemoglobin, we see that in the activation maps. Uh, also, we see a bigger response because we are summing the inflow effect and the uh, bold T2 star effect, and they go in the same direction. They augment each other. Uh, some other work that looked at uh, the effects of flip angle uh, was about a decade ago now from uh, Peter Mandatini's group. And they did uh, something that we used to do pretty much by default back in the early 2000s, which was use a small flip angle. And what they're showing is that you get these sort of parabolic uh, curves uh, for the true signal to noise in an image when you change the flip angle from uh, about 10 degrees up to about 90 or even over 90 degrees. But uh, that's not really what you're interested in. In general, you have fluctuations that you're interested in and what we would normally term physiologic noise, plus motion, head motion, typically. Uh, and what they found was uh, what we kind of sort of knew already in the early 1990s, which is that um, you don't really gain very much by uh, turning the flip angle up be uh, beyond a small number. Uh, the, all you really do is uh, augment the the physiologic noise and the motion sensitivity. The bold contrast is invariant to the flip angle. And that's what's shown by these flat sections. We're really not getting very much out of turning up the flip angle, except things that we might not be interested in. Uh, 
So low flip angles uh, in general are, are favored. Um, and so uh, this, this is uh, uh, one of the reasons why we might, might want to, um, to consider inflow as its own separate phenomenon, separate from bulk. Uh, so let's look at some real data. Uh, this is a simple experiment with relatively conventional uh, parameters for uh, a, a multi-slice EPI, not multi-band, just multi-slice, 3.5 millimeter cubic voxels, descending slices. So this is an axial prescription from the top of the head down, a five minute resting state run, 150 volumes with a TR of 2000. There are two conditions back to back, either a low flip angle, 20 degrees, or a high flip angle, 65 degrees. I'll note that the Ernst angle for uh, for gray matter would be around 75 degrees. So we're not quite at the Ernst angle, but it's still a very large flip angle compared to the low flip angle condition. For those of you who might, might be worried about using low flip angles, that your uh, images would get very weak, get, have low signal to noise. Um, well, here are the two uh, images side by side, a single frame of each, showing uh, with, the, with the contrast set constant between the two scans. And yet you see about a two to three fold difference in the absolute signal uh, in between the low and the high flip angle condition. But if I scale, zoom in uh, to a few of the slices and I scale, uh, set the uh, grayscales independently, then you find that the information content is quite uniform. There are very few obvious differences between the low and the high flip angle condition. There are a few subtle things. In fact, you might even argue that the CSF tissue uh, contrast is better in the low flip angle. Um, but in any case, they are sufficiently similar that I'm not going to worry that my images are going to be too dark to be useful. So with the data, data set that I, I've just uh, shown you, the, the two runs, the low and the high flip angle resting state runs, I'm gonna do a lag analysis on them. Let's see what the differences look like in the uh, hemodynamic lags. Can we detect a difference? We're going to use uh, Blaise Frederick's rapid tide. Hopefully in the next talk, he will explain how the method works in detail. I'll try and give you a quick overview now. The first thing you will obviously need to know is where do these low frequency oscillations come from? We're going to map these LFOs. Uh, what do they mean? Well, I've just shown a, a, a Fourier plot from one of uh, Yunji Tong's papers. Uh, we're dealing with the frequency band below about 0.2 Hertz. So it's this one over F character down in, on the far left over here. Um, and it's uh, fluctuations essentially in the, uh, the breathing, in your uh, blood gases. At least that's the mechanism that we think is operational. There are other potential contributions too. Uh, Non-stationary blood pressure will be one to consider. But uh, the biggest, most likely uh, driver of these LFOs is probably the non-stationary CO2 with a secondary contribution from non-stationary arterial oxygen saturation that I hope Toshihiko Aso has uh, already talked about. Um, we can discuss more about this perhaps in later on. So um, let's look at the rapid tide method. Uh, in this cartoon, I'll try and walk you through it and then hopefully Blaze will give you the, the gory details later on. Um, for this example, I'm gonna use as a seed in the time series, a single voxel in the superior sagittal sinus. I'm going to use the superior sagittal sinus because conceptually it's easier, easy to understand what happens to blood flow. If we go later in time from some point at the crown, let's say, then the blood in the superior sagittal sinus will flow away from where I started and it will go, it'll be heading away from the brain back down into the neck, back to the lungs for reoxygenation. But if I go earlier in time, then the superior sagittal sinus has drained blood from the brain tissue. So if I work backwards in time, I'll go through to the brain tissue, eventually back into the arteries. At least that's the theory. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to pick uh, this uh, regressor. So just the, from the 150 volume time series, we'll pick a point uh, in the superior sagittal sinus. And we will, we will then look for correlations uh, with all the other voxels in the time series, anywhere in the brain, that um, have a correlation with the superior sagittal sinus time course, but with one twist. We're going to look at one TR uh, displaced from the, from the uh, superior sagittal sinus or the reference seed. So we're gonna look forwards in time initially, we're gonna look at the plus one TR condition, and we're gonna ask the question, uh, how much correlation is there? We'll say, uh, we'll, we'll, we have to assign some 
uh, criteria, we'll say we'll accept anything that has a cross correlation greater than 0.5 uh, at a lag of plus one TR relative to my uh, zero point, which is my uh, superior sagittal sardis voxel. Now we don't care where those voxels are in space, they can be anywhere, most likely they will be somewhere else in the superior sagittal sinus. And then what we'll do is we will add up all of those correlating voxels, we will make that the next regressor, and we will circle around using that average time course of all of the uh, correlations and do the same procedure all over again recursively. But this time we'll switch to another plus one TR, so now we're two TRs removed from the origin, but we're making a comparison of plus one TR to plus two TRs. So all the voxels that were previously correlated between zero and plus one TR correlated with what uh, anything in the brain that's correlated with plus two TRs. Um, now quick, you quickly run out of oomph in this uh, example because the superior sagittal sinus is a draining vein and we, we uh, very quickly violate our 50 uh, voxel criterion. So what we're now going to do is switch back to the beginning, start the, uh, the uh, reference over again at time zero, but now we'll go backwards in time, minus one TRs, minus two TRs, and so on, each time going through this recursive loop. And what we'll do as we back up through time is we will eventually uh, find that we uh, reach a peak at around, in this case, minus four TRs, uh, where, depicted by the black circle, where a majority of the voxels in the brain have a very strong correlation with the, with the three TR position immediately before it. And they also have a very strong correlation with the plus five, with the minus five uh, TR correlation immediately uh, earlier than it. That is most likely because this uh, correlation simply represents the bulk of the brain tissue. So what we're seeing here is essentially a distribution where we're going uh, from the right-hand side, we're going towards venous blood, in the middle, we're uh, mostly in the tissue, in the arterioles and venules. And then as we go progressively towards the left to earlier times, we are flowing upstream towards the arterial, the feeding arteries. And again, we eventually run out of steam and there is uh, less than 50 voxels correlation at some multiples of TR, in this case, about minus 10 TRs uh, earlier than the reference seed in the superior sagittal sinus. By that point, there's no correlation left. We would stop our procedure. Now, what we can then do is make maps of each of these positions. So if we've got uh, 10 plus, uh, minus 10 plus 2, we've got uh, 12 different positions relative to the, to the uh, seed voxel at time zero. So we have these uh, regressors, this regressor set, and we can build a series of GLMs, in this case 12, where we use the time zero uh, time course relative to plus 1 TR, that's one GLM, the time zero versus two TRs and so on and so on. When we look at that, that set, we can play them through and they will essentially give us a flow uh, type phenomenon where we track the information going through the brain. So uh, that's what I'm gonna show you now. From that full set of GLMs, we can also define a maximum delay map. So this is simply gonna collapse that set of GLMs to a single display representing the point in space uh, sorry, the value at each point in space that gives the maximum uh, correlation with the zero point. So something I need to emphasize is that the zero point is very important here. So in these two maps for the low and high flip angle conditions, I'm looking relative to the global mean signal. So uh, typically when we do rapid tide today, rather than using the superior sagittal sinus as a seed, we use the tissue value, uh, the, 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 basically the global mean signal, uh, for two reasons. One, it's computationally efficient, it converges more quickly, and two, we are neither heavily venous weighted nor heavily arterial weighted, we're somewhere in between. So it's a, it's a physiologically, it's a good uh, place to start it with the, the least bias in our, uh, in our measurement, or in our analysis, I should say. So when we run this analysis uh, separately on the low and the high flip angle conditions, this is what we see. Ostensibly very similar looking patterns. The yellow patterns are the long lag, uh, the, latest, the later arriving or later peaking blood, uh, pe peaking LFOs, uh, and the blue patches are the early arriving or early peaking uh, um, signals. And we'll see, we see now that uh, in the high flip angle condition, there are many more dark blue splotches than there are in the corresponding positions 
for the low fluid angle condition. So something has changed. We're getting earlier arriving blood or we're getting a larger effect at the early delays relative to the global mean signal simply by turning up the flip angle. That's all we've done between these two. Um, it's instructive to look at the histograms. So I've tried to plot these on the same uh, y-axis, the same vertical scale. So the area under these curves is constant. And you can see immediately that there's a big difference in the distribution. So in this case, for the comparison, zero time is the global mean signal for the low flip angle condition. And so, and I've kept the zero common between these two. And you can see immediately that this middle green bar down here uh, on the lower panel has shifted by about minus one second. So by turning up the flip angle, the global mean has already shifted itself by about one second between the low and the high flip angle condition. And we also have some other features. There's clearly a big peak at about minus two, uh, two to two and a half seconds. And there's another little shoulder here at about plus three seconds. Uh, this early arriving uh, uh, peak with, the, with a large number of voxels at about minus two or minus three seconds is almost certainly going to be arterial blood. So we've enhanced the inflow effect and that's allowed us to pick up or to detect lags on the arterial side with more prominence than in the low flip angle condition. One thing I didn't mention is that inflow effects are not arterial or venous, they are flow effects. Uh, now we tend to see uh, more inflow on the arterial side, but that's because of the asymmetry in the, the blood supply. The blood is going up into the head and we tend to always have RF pulses across the head. So the venous blood is almost always being uh, tagged more than the arterial blood that's coming up from the neck. Uh, but we, we can see uh, inflow effect on the venous side. And I, my suspicion is that this shoulder at about plus three seconds is an accentuation of the large draining veins. This is also an inflow effect, if you like an outflowing inflow effect. Um, same, uh, this is just the sink, the, the high flip angle uh, condition. It's just, a, I've changed the color scale. Uh, so it's, a, it's again a, max, uh, a maximum uh, uh, delay map relative to the global mean signal for the flip angle 65 condition. And now we can look around uh, for regional differences and try and interpret what might be, go might be going on. If we go back and look at the superior sagittal sinus, we see that the, uh, the superior sagittal sinus has a delay of about plus six seconds relative to the global mean signal, which we assume represents the tissue. Whereas if we drop down here into motor cortex, uh, from the, uh, fed by the middle, middle cerebral artery, then this peak or this position in the tissue has a, a maximum delay of about minus four seconds. So very big difference than the superior sagittal sinus. And this makes sense because it takes about 10 to 12 seconds for the blood to transit from the internal carotids back to the jugulars in a normal uh, healthy brain. So this is, uh, this is essentially giving us a transit map uh, of, of the brain, if you like. Um, just for comparison, if I was to show you the same map for the low flip angle condition, then for this position at the, in the motor cortex, we would have a delay of about minus three seconds. So we would still see uh, the delay, it's just that it would be different. Um, so I've given you one example, um, the, changing the flip angle. What else could you change that might affect your ability to map uh, um, hemodynamic lags, uh, or if you like to put it another way, what's likely to change the bias or the balance point between your bold weighting and your inflow weighting in, a, in an fMRI experiment. This is true of any fMRI experiment, resting state or task. Uh, so the first uh, set of, of considerations is the hardware. It will make a difference. It changes the, uh, the relaxation times, which of course are paramount, especially for T, T1, uh, so in, given that this is an apparent T1 effect. But even the uh, head coil will make a difference if you're uh, using a, a restricted head coil, a, a head only a, array at seven Tesla, you will get a different inflow effect than with a body gradient, at, or sorry, a body uh, RF coil at three Tesla. Um, also perhaps a difference between um, parallel transmit and no parallel transmit. That's something I've been pondering recently. So if you're gonna compare your old Siemens Trio data to a Siemens Prisma, then bear in, bear in mind, even for the same subjects with ostensibly the same parameters, you may get a slightly different result, something for you to look at. Uh, TE is on its own. It's really a, a, a bold parameter only, uh, but the TR and the flip angle in white are, I consider as a pair. 
because they really together determine the apparent T1 effect. And then uh, last, but by no means least, all of the spatial parameters uh, that define your voxel dimensions, the slice order, whether you're going descending or if you're interleaving, and of course, whether you're using a simultaneous multi-slice experiment. All of these spatial parameters will, inter will, will uh, be affected by the blood flow to some extent and will give you a, a slight difference in the inflow that you will, that, uh, you will uh, see in your final uh, result. So uh, given that, especially with the SMS, there's a great tendency in, in going from non, from regular EPI to SMS to change many parameters simultaneously. Voxel size often gets smaller, TR gets shorter, TE may get shorter or longer depending. Uh, and uh, the, um, of course you're changing the, the way that you're slicing across the brain. Uh, all of these together are going to give you some different uh, level of inflow pattern uh, that is not necessarily uh, easy to understand except by looking at it. Uh, so in summary, um, just for, for single shot gradient echo EPI, as far as um, we are concerned as practitioners, the inflow weighting is primarily determined by the TR and the flip angle. So if you just wanna be able to play with a parameter, flip angle is a good place to start, leave the TR alone and, and maybe just tweak the flip angle. It gives you interesting things. Um, I've already mentioned that everything tends to change uh, with SMS. But anytime you're changing some, some, something spatial, expect there to be a difference in inflow. Uh, there's no best way yet uh, either to encode or decode the information. Some of you are interested in, uh, like me, mapping lags for their own sake. Uh, and some of you are interested in mapping them so you can get rid of them because you consider them noise. Um, which is the best way to do it? Whether you should use a low flip angle and minimize the problem or use a high flip angle and maximize your chances of capturing the problem? I can't tell you. That's something for us also to, to look at in the future. And just a, a final note about other sequences. If you're doing some other kind of fMRI like Vaso, there should also still be the opportunity to do lag mapping, except that of course, you're gonna be very heavily biased, perhaps exclusively biased to the uh, arterial side. You're not gonna have much um, a bold contrast, hopefully on the venous side. So you're, but you're, you should still be able to at least do sort of arterial uh, uh, transit uh, mapping. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Blaze for creating a couple of figures for me and, uh, and also the rest of my organizers of this symposium who have provided us, all of us, with uh, a nice distraction every Tuesday morning for the last year. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, this so, uh, symposium is just one of the benefits that have come out of that uh, collaboration. So thanks to, to, the, uh, to my six compatriots. Uh, thank you very much, and I shall gladly take your questions. Thanks, man. Um, you know, you do, if you have questions, we do have time for very short questions because we're a little bit behind. Um, I will, just one. Uh, okay, just okay, just one. <laughs> okay, um, Yanis. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to say that um, ninety percent of the things that I know about MRI and learning from Ben, he's uh, just been a brilliant scientist and a brilliant colleague. Uh, starting from his blog all the way to sort of the meetings that we were having every week. I just want to put it out there. Um, and Ben, one sort of question that I have for you is, have you have we looked at data in terms of different SMS factors and how that affects hemodynamic lags? I know you put it on the, on the discussion, but I don't remember if we had that data and whether there were effects there. <clears throat> right, Thank we've, you. We've, we've collected the data and um, Blaze, do you want to sort of give a, a brief overview of what we found? We, we, we find differences, right? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I would only be confident in saying we found differences. I I, I don't remember because uh, we we were doing the processing in the run up to the to the uh, symposium, and so yeah. uh, it kind of fell off the side of the world. So yeah, one of the problems that I find particularly with SMS is that you've got about eight or ten headline parameters that change generally. So it, you can do a contrived comparison, right, by maintaining everything fixed, the voxel size, etc. Uh, and then do a relatively low MB factor. So that's what we backed up to do. So we'll let you know, but um, I suspect it will make some difference. Then the question is whether it's systematic in the reconstruction or if it's just the, the way that the um, RFs in, pulses interact with the blood flow. Yeah, I mean, one thing I do recall is that um, larger, uh, less uh, fine spatial resolution actually led to better data. 
uh, in a way which was a little confusing because you would have thought, well, you know, if you just filter the data after the fact, it'll be fine. Uh, not, not so much. It seemed that the lower resolution data was uh, reconstructed somewhat more, um, somewhat more consistently. So, yeah, and it would be partial primary effects yeah. for sure. And then I guess another effect is uh, is the flip angle, which we sort of backed up to to to, to do the most basic things, uh, because generally when you go short TR, you know nobody, not even I, get as aggressive as the small flip angles that uh, Xavier Gonzalez Castillo recommended. I think he's down at like nine. I get to twenty, and then I start to get speed balls. So, <laughs> okay, um, we'll we'll have some questions at the end. So um, let's move on. So our next speaker is Blaise Frederick, and uh, Dr. Blaise Frederick is associate professor in psychiatry, Harvard Medical School, and a biophysicist at the McLean Hospital. He's also director of technical and instrumentation core at the McLean Hospital Brain Imaging Center. He received a BS in physics from Yale University and a PhD in biophysics from University at Berkeley, a University of California at Berkeley. His training is in MR physics. He is the director of the McLean Optomagnet Group, simply called OMG. And his research is focused on developing multimodal acquisition and the process, processing, strate, processing strategies for hemodynamic quantitation and the physiological denoise of both data. He wrote, maintained open source Reptile software suit. And on my personal note, and Blaze was my mentor when I was working at the McKinney Hospital. And uh, he's been my mentor and my friend since then. So uh, please, Blaze. Okay, so now we're gonna have a, a change of pace. We're gonna talk instead of physiology or uh, things about the actual brain, we're gonna talk about the methods of measuring um, Measuring, of measuring time delay. Uh, the purpose of this talk is to sort of give a, a sense of what's involved in doing time delay estimation measurements, what kind of gotchas you're gonna run into and uh, how you might address these various problems. I can show you some, some uh, solutions that I've come up with. Uh, these are not necessarily optimal, but they do work to some extent. And I'll just sort of let you know uh, one way of approaching this. Um, so I'll be talking about rapid tide in particular because that's what I'm most familiar with, but these are generally applicable principles. So what are we trying to do here? Uh, we're trying to characterize global bloodborne non neuronal signals in the brain. Uh, so we want to know what do they look like, where do they go, uh, when do they get there, and how do they get So in answer to the question, what do they look like, that depends on whether you're looking at endogenous fluctuations or exogenous fluctuations that you, you've put into the, the data. Um, so first off, there are naturally occurring low frequency variations in oxy-deoxyhemoglobin concentration. And that, this is generally thought of in the band of 0 0.009 to 0 0.15 hertz. The, the actual, the, the exact definition of this band is, is uh, you know, every author has a slightly different um, definition. I've seen it go up to 0.2 hertz, although that sometimes includes respirations. So you might want to do that, might not want to do that. Well, and it goes slightly below, but th this is a good, a good sort of intermediate value that we've been using for several years. Um, and this leads to uh, these, these endogenous fluctuations show up with what are called low frequency oscillations that you see in fMRI and in FNIRS data. Um, and the reason these are important is because they account for something like 50% of the bullet signal variance in the gray matter um, in band, um, which is, and unfortunately this band is the band where you expect to see neuronal, uh, hemodynamic responses to neuronal activation. So it's important that you figure out a way to deal with them, either modeling and removing them or just averaging until, you know, averaging until you, they, they go away. Um, so where do they come from? Um, we don't actually know the answer to that question. And answer, we actually have several answers. Um, you know, and because biology is never one thing or another thing, it's probably some, you know, some combination of all of these things. I mean, there's uh, laser motion, there's the propagation of, of uh, minor waves, there's uh, depth of respiration differences over time. Uh, I've even seen evidence that uh, the global immune signal is affected by uh, gastric motility. Um, doesn't really matter for the purposes of this discussion because what we're looking for are signals that are originate in the periphery. Um, uh, we know this because we see them everywhere. Um, and we also know that they seem to appear first in, in the brain in the internal carotid. So that implies that they're coming through the blood vessels to get into the brain. Um, now this is distinct from exogenous fluctuations. Uh, you can impose variations in the oxy-deoxyhemoglobin concentration 
uh, with breathing paradigms, gas challenges, and closed loop uh, interventions, such as uh, the use of a respirator, something like that. Um, and that's nice because you can get much larger and much more controlled effects. I mean, you, you get exactly the timing and, and, and uh, amplitude that you want. Um, and getting bullet signal changes on the order of 20 to 30% are you know, fairly easily achieved using these manipulations. I'm gonna be focusing on the exogenous, um, the endogenous signals, but all of these processing techniques will work for both. Okay, so where do these signals go? And basically the answer is everywhere. Uh, we've seen them everywhere we've looked. We've looked in the fingertip, toe, cheek, tongue, earlobes, and all over the brain. Um, we originally saw these uh, in the brain um, uh, in, a, in a concurrent FNR fMRI data uh, experiment. But then we started looking all over the place and we found that we could record them everywhere and we found that there were time delays between them at the different uh, locations. And we're talking about the low frequency, the low frequency variation here. Um, and that's important because that, that gives us a method to, to look at, uh, at blood flow. And so you see in the lower right-hand corner here, we've got this fingertip versus the global mean. So even the, you know, the, finger, the, the nearest recording in the fingertip looks very much like the global mean signal in the head. So that, that shows you that this gets into the brain, but of course there is a delay between about, of about three seconds. Um, so if the signal's all over with different time delays, then we can, if we can measure these time delays, then we can figure out when the blood gets to these locations because these, these signals are carried by the blood. Um, as far as we can tell, we've, we've tried very hard to establish that that is true. And we've also tried to establish that that is false and failed. So that's good. Uh, that's not to say that all signals that move through the brain are moving with the blood. There, there, people have talked about slow neuronal waves of activation. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. And we've tried in our, uh, you know, our measurements, we try to figure out ways to reject those. And, uh, you know, we really are looking for global signals all over the brain. Um, so these are some combination of oxygenation and volume fluctuations. Uh, I mean, these are the volume fluctuations are probably caused by, you know, transient changes in, in PACO2 in the blood as the blood moves through the brain. It uh, will you know, dilate the vessels as it goes by if, it, if the CO2 is changing. Um, you know, that, that will have its own temporal response, but we're going to ignore that for the time being. We're just looking at, you know, when does the effect of the signal get to different parts of the brain? Um, we refer to these low, uh, these moving, this move, moving signal as systemic low frequency oscillations. And this is to distinguish it from low frequency oscillations that may be due to, you know, neuronal activity or something like that. Um, okay, so we expect to see these signals fairly, uh, fairly easily in the brain because, uh, Blood oxygenation and volume changes affect the bold signal, and the brain is very highly perfused. So anything that affects blood is probably going to show up in the brain. Um, so if we make maps of the arrival time of these SLFO perturbations, uh, we're probably going to we're going to be able to tell when blood arrives at the various places because that's how we believe the signal is carried through the, uh, through the brain. Um, and if you make those time, if you make maps of the time delay and the strength of the of the uh, the signal, you can use those directly, for instance, cerebral hemodynamics, because they can tell you a lot about normal and pathological circulation. Uh, or you can use these delays to generate single voxel regressors and then sort of optimally regress out this low frequency signal in order to see the neuronal activation that, that may or may not be what you care about. Um, okay, so we've talked about finding these signals initially using, using NURSE in the fingertip or whatever. Um, but if you don't have a NURSE, uh, if you don't have NURSE data, that's okay. Um, and because, as we say, because the signal is global, because it shows up everywhere in the body, it shows up in the brain and it shows up, it, it, the, the signal is large in the brain and is correlated with the finger. So therefore you should be able to get it out of the brain. Um, so you can do worse than uh, starting a large blood vessel. You could go into superior sagittal sinus, you can go to the interior carotid, uh, or you can just average over the entire brain because in people with healthy circulation, the entire transit time through the brain is under 10 seconds. And so a very low frequency signal like this if you're over a range of delays, it's gonna sum up to be pretty much itself. You know, it'll be a little blurred out, uh, but it's not a terrible starting point. Uh, then once you uh, are into this procedure, you can actually refine it using a technique that I'll show at the end of the talk. Um, okay, so how do I estimate time delays? Uh, well, in the examples that I showed before, uh, you know, comparing the finger and the toe, you can just line up the peaks by eye, measure it with a ruler and you're done. Um, that doesn't work very well for noisy data or for if you have, you know, tens of thousands of voxels. Um, so more generally, what you want to do is you want to calculate what we call a similarity function, which measures the degree to which one signal looks like another signal. And then you do that over a range of different time delays. And wherever there's a maximum, that tells you where they're most lined up. Um, so correlation and mutual information are two ways of measuring similarity. 
Uh, they each have their advantages and disadvantages. Correlation has a lot of advantages. Uh, so that's what we use for the most part. Okay, so I'm talking specifically here about the cross correlation. Um, so correlation is the degree to which a pair of variables is linearly related. Um, you know, fortunately for us, old is a basically a linear phenomenon. It's linear in uh, with blood oxygenation. It's linear with blood volume for the most part. Um, so as these signals cruise through the brain, we we see them. You know, they they add to uh, whatever uh, other activity we might see there. They don't multiply or anything anything weird like that. So we're most familiar with the Pearson correlation. You know, from for example, if we do connectivity analysis, we make those dense connect domes. Uh, where, where we're just we're looking at the similarity of one voxel signal to another signal. Well, that's an extension of this where we're sliding, you know, we're sliding the time delay between them to find out the time that they're maximally aligned. Um, okay, so correlation is nice for a number of reasons. One of them is that the correlation is uh, coefficient is very easy to interpret. Uh, if you properly normalize your correlation, which is easy, uh, you find that it has a very clear interpretation of the values. If you have an R value, which is the correlation coefficient of one, the signals are identical. If it's negative one, they're identical, but different in sign. Uh, if it's zero, the signals are completely unrelated. And 100 times R squared tells you the amount of variance in one signal that's accounted for by the other signal in percent. Uh, okay, so just to do a concrete example here, here's a, a brain voxel uh, on the left. Uh, the red time course is a single voxel time course from a resting state experiment, six and a half minute resting state experiment, uh, filtered to the LFO band that I was talking about before. And then the blue regressor is the uh, is our probe regressor. And uh, we start out from the global mean and then we refine it with, with the procedure I'll talk about later. So what we do is we calculate the cross correlation between these two and that gives you a, that gives you a function between plus and minus the, the length of, the, of the, the time sequence. And if we zoom in, to the center here, which is the sort of region in which we expect to see the time delays that are physiologically relevant, which is maybe you know plus or minus plus minus ten seconds, plus thirty seconds, about the, the absolute range of what you'll see in healthy people. It can go out to maybe a hundred seconds in people with gross pathology. Um, but you see the correlation function is maximized here at about minus two seconds. Uh, that's that's the peak point in here, uh, with a value of 0 0.65. That gives you, you know, something like forty percent shared variance. Um, okay, so I can just pick the peak point there. And, uh, and I've got the time delay. Uh, so I can just do that in every box and I'm done, right? Well, you probably don't want to do it that way because if you, if you just pick the peak point, um, the, the resolution of the correlation function is the TR, uh, the resolution of that correlation function that you generated is the TR of the acquired data. Now, this is old school data, this is one and a half second TR. So our spacing for delay measurements, if we just pick the maximum is the TR. And if you can see over here on the right of the histogram, is got basically five values. Uh, so you get this very posterized delay map over here in the middle, um, which is not as good as you might want. Um, so you can do better than this. Uh, and one thing I always, you know, a little soapbox I like to get on the common misconception is that the time resolution of delay estimation with cross correlation is, is the time step TR. Uh, but the cross correlation function actually uses every point in the series. So in fact, the, the theoretical resolution is something like TR divided by the total number of points in the time series, uh, which is essentially, you know, continuous resolution. Um, so you, you can do a lot to, to, try to, to try to improve the, the resolution of this signal um, to get the better, res, better spectral resolution. So the first thing you can do is just, uh, just oversample. That's an easy thing. You, just, you know, you, you interpolate points between the uh, between the, uh, the values and you find the maximum that way. And if you look here, you'll see that the, your, your delay histogram is far more continuous and your map is looking a lot better. Um, but you can do better than that, actually. Um, the way you do that is uh, you just do peak fitting because that peak, uh, if you can take a continuous function like a Gaussian or parabola and just fit, you know, say maybe the top five points, uh, you can get essentially continuous resolution of, of, the, of the time delay. Uh, so you see here in this in this histogram, in an example where I've done oversampling and peak fitting, uh, there's essentially no quantization in the time delay measurement, which is great. Okay, but we still have another problem. We're not we're not home free. Um, if you look here, you'll notice that there are a lot of little islands of you know uh, extremely different delay values. Uh, my my um, you see all these little yellow pixels sprinkled about. Uh, that have very different time delays. Well, I mean, maybe they're blood vessels, but they're not blood vessels, as it turns out. 
Um, these are just areas where the correlation function is harder to interpret. Um, and the reason for that, if we, if we start the little movie here, if you look here, we've got a, we've got a sort of a weak peak. Um, and then there's another peak over here on the right. You see these two peaks just to keep, continue to appear in all of these boxes as I scroll along, along this line. But at some point, the interpret, you know, the, the, the actual peak moves up. And that's because the baseline of the correlation function has twisted a little bit. And you end up jumping to the wrong peak. Now, you kind of know that what you really wanted to do is stay on that peak um, because of, you know, other information you might have. So how do you do that? Um, and this is, this is a general problem using these correlation methods, is pseudo, pseudo periodicity. Um, when you're using the endogenous noise waveforms, you end up, you, you, just, you have to use what you get, right? Uh, noise is noise, and sometimes noise is not very well behaved. Um, ideally, the SLFO would have a, a white spectrum across the band that you're interested in, you know, equal power in every band. Um, but that's almost never the case. Usually what happens is it's concentrated more on the low end than the high end. It's sort of colored noise, pink noise. Um, uh, but also you can also, you can sometimes get concentrations of, of spectral power, you know, either just randomly because that's that's what happened that day, or maybe there's some sort of pseudo periodic breathing. Uh, this happens more in older people. We tend to see these more periodic, um, periodic components in, in the SLFO. Um, so you end up with, when you do the cross correlation function, the cross correlation itself becomes pseudo periodic. You have a big main lobe and then you have these little side lobes uh, and side loads can actually get quite large relative to the main peak. And if the, if the baseline is moving around because of noise in the data, uh, then sometimes the side loads can jump up above the, the height of the main peak, which is bad. Um, so a couple of ways around this that I've found, and there may be other ways. Um, if there's signal is truly periodic, I mean, it's just, say, it's just a, you know, very tight band limited signal, you can notch it out or take it out with GLM filter or something. I've, been able, I have not been able to get this to work very reliably um, uh, in real data. Um, if sidebands are large, you can try to use speckling, which I'll explain in a second, uh, which that, that actually works pretty well. And then finally, you can enhance the similarity measurement using by pulling in other similarity metrics. Okay, so despeckling is uh, something I came out with, up with to deal with these, these little islands. And basically, it's just a median filter. You, uh, for every voxel in the brain, you look at the delay, you look at the median of the delays around it. If you differ by the median of your neighbors, by the distance between uh, the main peak and the first side lobe, which are detected in a separate routine, then you basically jump back to the main side lobe. You sort of do this discontinuous jump, and then you you refit tightly around that that peak. Um, that works. If that that works really well. Whenever you get to one of these step discontinuities, it'll generally erode away the edges of the discontinuity. If you do this for many iterations, maybe four, uh, you tend to make those little islands go away, and so you get a much better, much smoother map, which I would argue is probably more real. Uh, you know, I don't think this is just an artifactual smooth thing. I think this is real, really smooth data. Otherwise, it wouldn't show. It, I don't think it would show up as nicely as it does. Um, but even that doesn't always work. Uh, and so another thing we've started doing is using the cross-mutual information. So cross-mutual information, mutual information is another way of measuring the similarity of, of two signals, but it's not a nonlinear measure. It's basically just saying, does knowledge, you know, to what extent does knowledge of one signal give you knowledge of the other signal? And it's completely agnostic to any sort of functional relationship. It can be, you know, it could be the signal squared, it could be, you know, it doesn't care inside, it could be the log of the signal, it doesn't really matter. It's just saying, if I know more about signal one, can I predict signal two by reducing the entropy of the second signal? Um, so it's, it's a little harder to use than cross correlation. Uh, there are not a lot of canned methods to, um, to calculate it, and they're not, uh, they're not terribly well optimized numerically. Um, uh, it's a bit hard. The other thing is it's a bit hard to interpret the absolute value of them of mutual information. Um, and there are ways of normalizing it, but I've never seen anything quite as clear as an R value where you can say, yeah, this, this amount of variance is explained in signal two by signal one because the R value is this. But uh, it does follow certain rules like a larger mutual information means the signals are more alike. So if you have, you know, if you do this over a range of delays, the biggest value is when they're best aligned. So that, that it's good for that. It's good for finding the absolute delay, not so much what the strength of the association is. Uh, but it's also, it's very expensive to calculate. The best optimized version I've managed to come up with is about 10 times as slow as the cross correlation. So if you use that for your primary metric of similarity, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so, Uh, we, we've adopted a hybrid similarity function when what we do here is we just calculate the cross correlation is normal. And if you have multiple peaks, you also then calculate the um, calculate the mutual information at, at both at, at each of the peaks. And then you just pick the peak that has the largest mutual information. 
So that's nice because it goes basically as fast as a cross correlation, but it's actually, it's more accurate and you tend to make these little islands go away, which is good. It doesn't mean it's the best solution, but it's a solution that works pretty well. Uh, okay, so significance, how do we calculate, how do we decide if these cross correlations we're getting are, are spurious? Um, well, if you use a standard formula to get P values from R values, uh, you're gonna see that you have like, you know, P of, you know, 10 to the minus 40 all over the brain. Uh, and that's because the, the standard relationship between R and P doesn't, doesn't hold for the kind of data that we're doing. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're using band limited correlations, which tend to inflate the correlation values. And also we're doing this, uh, we're doing correlation over a range of time delays and we're picking the biggest value. I mean, that's sort of the, that's the, the worst kind of P hacking, right? You're picking the best result out of, out of a set. Um, so the way you get around this is you do a Monte Carlo estimation. Uh, I mean, it, it, you, there are methods to maybe try to estimate this analytically, but none of them work very well because the signal itself is not very well defined. Um, so we just use a permutation method. We take our, our probe regressor uh, and then we cross correlate it with a shuffled version of itself. We interchange the time points, we filter so that we don't get any sharp edges. Um, and then uh, we just build up a distribution of say 10,000 10, spurious correlations. Then we measure where the P of 0.05 uh, value is. Alternatively, you could use a phase scrambling in the Fourier domain, which is supposedly better for various reasons, but I haven't been able to get that to work properly yet. Um, okay, so this is just a graphical description showing that, you know, sort of the, in the, in the classical case where you have completely a, uh, uncorrelated data, um, uh, you have a sort of a narrow distribution of spurious correlations. When you apply a bandpass filter, this broadens it out, you tend to inflate your correlations. Uh, if you are picking the optimal delay, you're going to tend to make the thing positive definite because you're always picking the biggest value. Uh, and then if you bandpass filter and do that, you, it's the worst case. You, you, your distribution is way off to the right here and it's wider. But if you if you do simulation, if uh, just do Monte Carlo, you're fine. Uh, okay, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is refinement. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can improve whatever initial estimate you get for your regressor. Uh, so we use an analog of the iterative procedure that Ben described uh, in the previous lecture. Um, so you get a probe regressor from wherever you measure it in the, the global mean signal, you do NIRS, uh, you calculate the global mean uh, in the data set, and you cross correlate that with every voxel in the brain, you determine the magnitude of the time shift, and then you take your data and you shift every voxel in the data set so that you align that the moving component in every, in every voxel. Uh, so now you have a better un, untemporally blurred estimate of the, of the, uh, the moving regressor. So you do PCA or averaging to pull out the, the shared variance between all the voxels. Now you've got a new, better unblurred estimate. Do it again, and you should get a new, you, you iterate a few times until convergence, and that's usually two or three, uh, two or three cycles, or you, you meet a uh, convergence criteria, and you're done. And you get a much better estimate than you started with. Yeah, in some cases with severe pathology, even normal aging, this can actually be a little more difficult because uh, the global mean tends to be a little weirder in, in older people because you may have vascular territories or you know, over the years you've, you've built up what we call vascular personality. Some of your uh, delays are longer in vascular, other, some vascular territories than others. So your distribution is not this nice peaked Gaussian, but it may be multiple lumps over a, a wide range of, of delays. So you might want to uh, restrict it to some particular region of the brain. Okay, so this, this just brings up outstanding issues. There are a couple of things that we have never um, really resolved. I mean, we, and I just, you know, th these are things, if you if you wanna think about this, uh, think about great ways to fix it and tell me, uh, that'd be great. Um, correlation ambiguities, you know, the notch filtering and speckling and hybrid similarity, those, those are kind of hacks. Uh, they're heuristic, they work pretty well, but I'm not super comfortable with them. So if there's a better way to deal with that, well, I would love to see it. Um, where do you get your initial probe regressor? Uh, you know, as I say, with healthy normal controls, uh, you just take the global mean and it's great. Uh, as people get more and more complicated circulation, that becomes harder and harder to, uh, sometimes you get these you get these really weird distributions of initial values that can make your regressor uh, semi pseudoperiodic by making multiple copies of it itself. Uh, so it would be nice to have a sort of a, a, a standard way of picking out a regressor that you could trust every time. Uh, the last one is, you know, what what is zero time? You know, we always have these uh, graphed along a, a uh, we show this histogram with time delays. These are all, I, I always just set the, the mode of the distribution to be zero because there isn't any really, any single point in the brain that I can reliably say this is time zero. Um, it'd be nice to have a little more insight into what to pick for that. Uh, finally, uh, if you think you can help with any of these problems, I'd love to hear it. Uh, you know, I'm always happy to nerd out about cerebral 
you know, human dynamics and, and delay calculations. Um, I've tried to make rapid tide uh, have enough command line options that you can make it do almost anything. You can change the behavior radically just by changing command line options, but it is open source. So if you want to just dig into the code and change things that way, yeah, go for it. Um, and if coding isn't your thing, but you think that my rapid tide needs to change in some way, you know, open an issue on GitHub. And I'd be very happy to, to look into seeing what I could do to make uh, maybe implement uh, a, a fix. So in the end, I'd like to thank uh, all of my uh, co-organizers for this uh, seminar. Uh, the discussions you have had over the last year kept me sane during COVID. I um, also want to thank my collaborators, McLean, uh, at other institutions, and of course, all the people in my group. Thank you. Thanks, Blaze. Um, I do have a, a quick question, uh, but you know we're uh, actually very short on time. So uh, maybe after that, I'll move on to the last talk and then we'll have other questions answered at, at, uh, at the end. So my quick question is like, you know, Blaze, maybe this is a good opportunity for you to just basically introduce the, the, the thoughts behind Reputai. And, you know, so because on the last day, we're gonna really have a, a you know, dig into the Reputai, you know, given that uh, Yanis and, and Lee are gonna be working on that. But in, in general case, what, do you wanna talk about the thoughts behind it and what's the goal and what's the uh, general, you know, application? Yeah, I mean, I mean, generally the, the goal is to try to make uh, time delay analysis uh, you know, easily accessible to anybody. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's something that I, I think is worthwhile. I think uh, doing the, the lag mapping is, is useful and interesting for looking at cerebral vascular pathology. But I think also if you're doing, uh, uh, you know, resting state fMRI, task-based fMRI, I think uh, removing the hemodynamic noise, just, you know, basically you, you can double your signal to noise for free without doing another scan or doing any other work. Um, Rapatide is uh, is very heavily optimized. Uh, the the, um, the uh, data set that you saw, the, that six and a half minute uh, resting state scan, that's got a TR of one and a half seconds, uh, three and a half millimeter isotropic resolution uh, on an M1 Mac mini uh, processes in 34 seconds. So it's not like you're adding a lot of time to your processing, uh, adding it in. Um, so uh, I just, I, Please go out and use it. You know, it's uh, it's free. Cost you nothing, right? So you, all, all you'll waste is time if you decide you don't like it. So, thanks. Um, so the I'm gonna uh, Ben, you're gonna introduce me because yes. I'll be the next speaker. Yeah. So thank you, Yunji. So I'll take over the, the baton. Thank you. So, Yunji, uh, Yunji Tong, Dr. Yunji Tong is our last speaker. He's an assistant professor now at the Weldon School of Biomedical in Engineering at Purdue. Uh, he's the director of the Multimodal Imaging Lab. Uh, he received a bachelor's in physics from Beijing University and then a PhD in biomedical engineering from Tufts University. Uh, then his research is focused now on uh, multimodal brain imaging on function and perfusion. He's been working on extracting useful physiological parameters from fMRI or concurrent fMRI and functional near infrared data. But today, a, a slight twist uh, is going to present some work on cerebral blood flow, uh, sorry, uh, a CSF flow. Thank you, take it away. Hello, um, my name is Yunji Tong. I'm assistant professor at the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue University. Uh, my topic today is systemic low frequency oscillation of both fMRI and the flow of a cerebral spinal fluid. CSF is a clear fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. It cushions the brain and the spinal cord from injury. Recently, its role of removing the metabolic wastes through its circulation and through in interchange with interstitial fluid had been discovered, and the whole system is called the lymphatic system. The function seems to be emphasized and or even strengthened uh, during sleep, especially uh, during certain stage of the sleep. Um, interestingly, CSF does not have its own engine to generate the flow. Therefore, its flow has to be, you know, uh, generated or facilitated from other mechanisms, for example, the vessel wall movement. Therefore, the coupling between the cerebral blood volume and the uh, CSF flow become very, very important. In a recent study, Dr. Fusen O used fMRI to record concurrently the CSF inflow at a force ventricle as well as the bold fMRI signal in the brain. This allowed them to directly uh, study the coupling between the CSF inflow and uh, the brain hemodynamics 
such as the cerebral blood volume changes. Um, in their study, what they did is they placed the first slice of the fMRI scan at the fourth ventricle. And due to inflow effect, the CSF flow into the brain will bring higher signal intensity as shown on the side uh, of the slides. And um, um, in, you know, um, for these few voxels at force ventricle, um, the contrast we detect is inflow effect, not the, the typical bold contrast as we normally detect from fMRI. And uh, the temporal fluctuation detected at these few voxels really represents the amount of the uh, CSF inflow to the brain. And uh, um, more interestingly, what they did is they used this scan uh, sequence to study um, the CSF flow changes um, during sleep. And here I'm showing you the result of the CSF inflow signal they detect when the subjects um, in the non-run sleep versus the subjects in uh, awake states. You can clearly see that when the subject reaches non-run sleep stage, the CSF inflow significantly increased. And, um, um, and also more interesting, the oscillation frequency is about you know, um, 0 0.02 hertz, which is at the very low frequency range. And um, for the coupling, uh, here they show that the derivative of the global mix signal detected uh, at the other part of the brain versus of the CSF info signal, right? You can see the derivative of the, of the global mean signal here showing the bl blue is negatively correlated with the CSF info signal. And the correlation is pretty high. And also, um, if you uh, observe carefully, you can see that the derivative of the both, the negative derivative of both signal of the, uh, of the global mean signal is leading the CSF info signal in this particular case. Okay, um, after reading that paper, um, we had several uh, questions. The first one is, uh, what is the underlying mechanism of the coupling between the derivative ball signal and the CSF inflow? Um, uh, Dr. Fu didn't really give a very detailed um, mechanical model in their paper. Uh, the second is, does the similar coupling happen during awake states? They did a lot of a uh, study on the coupling um, during the non-REM sleep stage, uh, but we have a question is when people is awake, uh, does the coupling uh, still happen? And the third uh, question we had was, does the CSF flow in both directions at the force ventricle? Um, for uh, the brain scan they did, they can only assess the CSF inflow to the brain due to the inflow effect. And um, uh, the CSF flow, CSF outflow into the neck actually uh, cannot be measured uh, just using the brain scan as they did in their paper. So to answer question number one, uh, we generated a model in which we try to explain the coupling between the derivative of the ball signal and the CSF inflow. So the model is very simple. So from the left to right, we model the blood vessel dilation. Right? So blood vessel stays pretty much the same at the beginning, then you will dilate for a period of time, then later on it will come back to normal again. And uh, um, as we all know, when the blood vessel dilates, it will give pressure on the lateral ventricles. As, as a result of that, the CSF will flow at the fourth ventricle. However, the key point here is that when the blood vessel reach certain stage and stay there, the CSF flow doesn't happen. So CSF flow only happens when uh, the transition happens. In other words, when the blood vessel go from small to big or the blood vessel from big to small, only during those two transition points, the CSF flow will happen, right? So when the, CS, uh, the, the blood vessel go from small to big, actually, you know, that during that period, the, the CSF will be pushed out of the brain through force ventricle. However, when the CSF, uh, when the blood vessel go from big to small, as a result, the CSF at the force ventricle will be sort of like sucked into the brain. So the, the flow direction is very, very different uh, through these, uh, during these two transition periods. So how these things be reflected by the fMRI signal? 
So as we all know, FMIC, you know, especially the bold contrast, really represents, can represent CERB above volume, right? So here, if you look at the blood vessel change, um, the bold FMI signal will faithfully reflect the blood vessel volume change. So basically, you can see go from flat and you, you come to a higher, you know, bigger blood vessels, then you come back to uh, normal again. And this is typical your bold FMI signal will observe. Um, but this doesn't really reflect any transition, right? So to really get a transition out of this FMI signal, you have to take the derivative of the FMI signal. And as a result, you can see when we take the derivative of the FMI signal, we catch the transition period. The first one is a positive bump, and the second one is a negative bump. And these are, the positive represents the vessel dilation, and uh, uh, the, sec uh, the negative re represents vessel contraction. And if you compare this with the CSF inflow signal, right, at, I'm showing here that clearly the CSF inflow signal will be negative correlated with the derivative of my signal because the CSF inflow signal only happens when the vessel contract, right? So that explains why the derivative of the bow signal negatively correlated with CSF inflow signal. Um, in another word, if we are able to uh, detect CSF outflow signal to the neck, then you know you will be something like this, and you can see from here that the CSF outflow signal to the neck, right, should be positively correlated with the derivative of the ball signal, just due to the direction of that signal and due to the the nature of the derivative of the ball signal. Um, okay, so this is the model. Um, so. Then based on this model, uh, we can have uh, several predictions, right? The first prediction is the CSF inflow signal, you know, uh, or, or prediction or explanation. So CSF inflow signal should uh, negatively correlate with the derivative of global mean signal. And uh, a second thing is the CSF inflow signal should lag behind the negative derivative of global mean signal. This is because that based on this model, the global, uh, the, the cerebral blood volume change is the driving force for CSF flow. So, so in order for CSF flow to happen, the, the, the CBV has to, to change uh, earlier. So in, that's why the, the derivative of this, the global mean signal should happen earlier than the CSF flow. This is just because the causal relationship between these two, um, two factors. And also the last one is, is similar to the second one where, uh, that says uh, CSF outflow signal should be positively correlated with the derivative of global mean signal and also should be lagging behind the derivative of global mean signal for the same reason because global mean signal uh, represents uh, the hemodynamic changes that should happen earlier uh, because that's the driving force. Okay, so we'll uh, come back to these predictions uh, later on using our scans. To answer question number two and three, we conduct two consecutive scans uh, on each subject while they are fully awake. Uh, the first scan is what we call the brain scan, in which we uh, use the exact the same scan protocol from Dr. Fu's paper. And we make sure the first slice is covering the fourth ventricle and the rest of the slice covers the brain. And the second scan, uh, we did next scan. In this case, the first slice also at the same position covered the fourth ventricle and instead of brain, this time we scan the neck, right? So you can see clearly here that the info effect for the brain scan will, will tell us the CSF info to the brain as you show, uh, as it is shown on the right side. So that's the info effect uh, detected at the fourth ventricle representing the CSF info to the brain. While for the next scan, the info effect actually represent the CSF outflow to the neck, right? So here I'm showing you the, the CSF outflow signal at the force ventricle detected at the next scan, and these fluctuations actually represent the CSF outflow into the neck, right? So based on this, you can clearly see that, um, you know, the CSF flow is bidirectional. It does flow into the brain, but also it flows into the neck too. And also the, the majority, you can from these two scenes, you can see the, the, the major components of the sequence of the flow 
the sensor flow is in the low frequency range. We want to assess the coupling between CSF flow and the derivative of the bow signal in the brain. This will be a problem for the next scan, right? Because we didn't really scan the, the brain uh, during the next scan. So to solve this problem, actually, we use um, something we learned from our previous studies. And here I'm listed the publication uh, where you can find those studies. And in those studies, we uh, demonstrate that the bold contrast in the internal jugular veins, actually, um, they can be used as the delay version of the global mean signal of the brain. And uh, not only they very similar to the global mean signal in the brain, and we can know that they are delayed, and we know roughly the delay is about four seconds. So you can treat internal jugular vein signal as a delayed version of the global mean signal, and delay is about four seconds. Um, so that's exactly what we did, right? So in the next scan, what we did is we uh, take the internal jugular vein signal and here, and then we, uh, we do the derivative of the internal jugular vein signal and use that as a surrogate the signal for the brain. And here you can see the red showing the derivative of the internal jugular vein signal. And also um, the CSF outflow signal into the neck is catching um, at the fourth ventricle and which is shown at the blue here. And as we predicted, you know, the derivative of the, of the global mean signal is positively correlated with the CSF outflow signal in this particular case. Here I'm showing you the group results of 10 subjects. And on the left, you can see the, uh, the maximum cross correlation coefficient between the derivative of the internal jugular vein and your CSF outflow signal into the neck. And uh, the, you can clearly see they're positively correlated and with very high correlation value. On the right side is the delay. And you can clearly see here that the CSF outflow signal actually is leading uh, the derivative of the internal jugular vein signal. But remember that in the derivative of internal, the uh, internal jugular vein signal is delayed about four seconds um, uh, compared to the global mean signal. So if you count these four seconds into the thing in the whole calculation, then you realize that the CSF um, alpha signal actually is lagging behind the global mean signal about three seconds. Here I'm showing you the group results of the brain scan, right? Um, and uh, we did the uh, cross correlation between the derivative of the global mean signal and the CSF inflow signal to the brain. And you can clearly see that the maximum cross correlation between the derivative of the global mean signal and the CSF inflow signal are very, very high and they're negative. Right? It's about negative 0 0.75. And in this particular case, instead of doing the global mean signal of the whole brain, we also separate global mean signal into the gray matter, white matter, and CSF, and they more or less similar to each other. And the delay is very interesting. In this particular case, you can see that the, the delay indicates that the CSF signal is lagging behind the derivative of the global mean signal is about two to three seconds, which is exact same or close to what we observe when we do the next scan. Remember that? So in this particular case, we show that the CSF flow is always lagging behind the, uh, the derivative of the brain signal about two to three seconds. So what, the, what does this mean? So this really means that um, the cerebral blood volume change is the driving force for the CSF flow um, because of the delay, right? Um, okay, so here I'm showing you a very interesting phenomenon. So basically you can see the, the red curve here really represents the derivative of the global mean signal. On the left is the the true global mean signal on the right is the, uh, the internal jugular vein signal, which is surrogate global mean signal. And uh, the blue curve uh, represents that uh, the inflow signal, CSF signal to the brain on the left, and on the right is outflow CSF signal to the neck. And you can clearly see that, you know, this is also predicted by the model that the, uh, the negative part 
the lower part or the negative part of the derivative grooming signal matches very well with the inflow signal to the brain, while the positive part of the global mean signal, derivative of the global mean signal, match quite well with outflow signal into the neck. So this is very interesting because um, just by doing the derivative of the global mean signal, actually you're catching the CSF flow in both directions. And you know this could have a lot of impact on the future researches, and we still try to explore this on our own. And but I think it's very interesting to point out uh, this interesting phenomenon. And 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 as I said, this is a predicted by the model. Okay, um, so here I just wanted to summarize that you know um, for question number two, does the similar coupling happen during a weak state? The answer is yes, right. Uh, the question number three, does CSF flow in both directions and the force ventricle? The answer is also yes. So if the changes in CDV is the driving force of the CSF flow, then we would like to consider the change in CDV as so-called a pressure wave. So in this particular study, what we would like to do is we try to assess how this pressure wave propagates throughout the brain. The way to do that is we first take a derivative of fMRI signal at every voxel, right, to catch this uh, change of the CBV at every voxel. Then what we do is we use the CSF inflow signal as a regressor to cross-correlate uh, every uh, with the derivative ball signal at every voxel. Then this is the delay map we generated um, using the cross-correlation. And you can clearly see that this pressure wave is generated at a certain part of the brain, as shown here in the light blue. And then they all propagate through the brain. However, at the end, they all um, kind of propagate towards the neighbor region, neighboring region of the lateral ventricle. Then later on, you know, we know that then it, the pressure will squeeze the lateral ventricle, make the CSF flow happen. Right? So this actually shows um, you know, the, the spatial distribution or, or propagation um, uh, passage uh, for the pressure wave in the brain. Um, in this uh, slide, what I would like to show is the, the CSF inflow signal component. So what we did is we did a very simple Fourier transform on one of the, uh, you know, on all the CSF inflow signal. And this is the uh, one typical example. And you can see that uh, from the Fourier transform, you can see the low frequency component which is from 0.01 to 0.1 hertz and you have you can see the breathing component you can see the cardiac uh, component at one hertz and this is very interesting because this shows several things one is it shows that the low frequency oscillation is really the dominant driving force for the whole uh, CSF flow and we do not know uh, what's the cause for the slow frequency oscillation? Maybe the vessel motion, um, or some other. Hold on. But hey. also, we cannot ignore hey. um, the force job. coming from the breathing and the cardiac, uh, right? Perfect. And the breathing and the respiration, they might influence the CF, CSF flow through the same mechanism as we propose in this paper, but they might, and especially in a respiration, it might also um, force the CSF flow through some other mechanism uh, as being discussed by many other groups. We know the CSF flow in both directions. So lastly, we would like to try to uh, roughly assess the net flow of the CSF. Um, uh, we measure the CSF inflow uh, through brain scan, right, as, you sh as I'm showing on the top. And we also measure CSF outflow through the neck scan. And uh, uh, we know that the area underneath underneath each curve really represents amount of the flow observed at each scans, right? The, the inflow, the amount of inflow is represented by the red area and the amount of outflow is represented at, by the blue area. So to assess net flow, what we can do is we just subtract red area um, by the blue area and see if there's anything left. Um, and you can see we conduct this uh, kind of a um, you know, um, analyze on 10 subjects, and here is the info outflow number, and here's the subtraction results in the, the last figure. And averagely, uh, what we can see is we didn't detect very clear net flow 
um, from these 10 subjects. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. The first one is, of course, uh, this methodology is not accurate, right? So the info and the alpha of the CSF, they're not even acquired at the same time. So this methodology is not very accurate. Secondly, and uh, we all know that CSF is produced by the choroid plexus. And it's known that only 25 milliliter CSF was produced each hour. And, um, um, you know, given that small amount of produced, then, you know, uh, by averaging like 10 minutes, um, it's very hard to really uh, get to that level because such a small production rate. And if there is net flow somewhere, that it will be very hard for us to detect it um, using this rough assessment. To conclude, first, a uh, biomechanical model was proposed and its prediction, many of its predictions were validated. Second, similar coupling was identified during a weak state. And however, this doesn't mean the magnitude uh, of the CSA inflow signal uh, can reach as big as we observe in the non-REM sleep in uh, Dr. Fu's study, because uh, our study is not a sleeping study, so uh, we couldn't really compare the magnitude of the CSF signal, uh, flow signal, um, so that could be done in the future. Uh, however, but what we did demonstrate is the coupling between hemodynamics and CSF flow also happened uh, uh, when people are weak. Uh, lastly, the CSF flow in both directions were observed at the force ventricle with no clear net flow detected. Um, as now that we uh, did write a paper based on our, our findings and the paper is published um, in uh, um, archive and you can find uh, the paper uh, in this link and also um, the paper is under review by uh, uh, Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and the Mechanism. Lastly, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge the people who make significant contribution to this project. The first one is Dr. Yang, who's my first PhD student, and uh, he just got his PhD uh, degree a couple of uh, days ago. And uh, uh, he uh, has been a uh, fantastic and driving force for this project and, and uh, con conduct uh, scans and writing the paper. Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Ben Inglis, Dr. Thomas Tavich, and my uh, graduate student, Nvidia. They all make significant contributions uh, to this project. And I would like to thank my group uh, in Purdue, and I also like to acknowledge my funding agency uh, from Indiana CTSI, Purdue uh, Institute for Integrative Neuroscience, and also some funding from NIH. Thank you. and. Uh, Excellent, thank you, Yinji. So, right, uh, somebody said there's some raised hands. Did you spot a raised hand, Jonas? If not, then I shall move. I think I saw a raised hand. I'm not sure if it disappeared. No worries, I shall. There's a question, an anonymous question. Uh, so, in full, full set L, in the 2019 paper, the sleep paper, they set the minus db dt, uh, d, d bold dt to zero for the negative values of minus, d, uh, minus bold by dt before correlating it with the CSF inflow signal as inflow should only be correlated with a decrease of CBV. Did you set negative values of the neg of minus d bold dt to zero in your study? That's the... Um. I'm not fully understand the uh, the question. Basically, what we did is we uh, uh, always do is we uh, uh, detrend it and demand it. So the signal first be detrend and demand it. So it will be oscillating around zero. And um, you know, a very interesting thing about the CSF signal, and it's very easy to recognize is it has this kind of feature because it's only sensitive to the flow in one direction, one direction, right? Because of the inflow effect. So you have this kind of a flow. Now you have this kind of a plateau, uh, you know, um, of the signal where the you know when the flow in the other direction, the inflow signal won't happen, so it will be flat. So your signal will be like alternating between flat line and a, a peak. So that's how we you know really um, we're sure about the detection of the CSF. Um, then in terms of the car, you know, we didn't 
specifically nail anything to zero, we just do a demand and detrain and detrain and demand. Okay, makes sense. Yes, hey, hey, hey. Great, great talk. Can I ask? So, have you looked at like phase, like cardiac aided phase contrast measurements in the fourth ventricle and just sort of compared it with what you're getting with your inflow, just to sort of set up a sort of a you know a better understanding of what that inflow signal is and how you know it might be related to? Could you use it as a surrogate for you know phase contrast velocity measurements and in terms of you know fitting some inverse model based on your TR and things like that. that. That's a good thought. Like we haven't done that. Yeah. So, so the thing is, it would be very interesting to, to do something like that. And, and this is just the first, you know, cause I, we, we read that paper. We're very excited. We just, this is our like a first try to just answer basic question. But, you know, as Tom said, this is very, the starting point, like we really like jump on this and we're very excited for a lot of opportunity. Like the, the thing is we haven't tried that yet. Yeah. It's a good thought. Okay. Great talk. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Any raised hands? No. Uh, then uh, I shall take the, the uh, moderator's prerogative. So uh, I'm sure there are people that out there in fMRI land who are looking at this as uh oh, another thing to another problem to work around. Uh, given that people are using a comp core and things like that, uh, if there are several drivers of CSF flow through the fourth ventricle presumably you know, coming from the lateral ventricles and people are in the habit of using regions of interest in the uh, lateral ventricles, then uh, can you speculate on what this might mean for, um, for fMRI denoising? Uh, that's a good question. I, 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 I think this is really, um, you know, the signal detected at the fourth ventricle is very unique, right? As you know, in your talk, then you mentioned about inflow, so, so this inflow effect only happens at that last slice. If you read, you know, um, uh, Dr. Fu's paper, that it only happened the last slice, only within the, the force of ventricle. Um, you know, you only get the signal from that few voxels. Then you go to the second slice, the inflow effect almost disappears. And the third slice is definitely gone. So, so the thing is, so I do not picture that at the lateral ventricle wall, you will have any inflow effects at all. Uh, and most likely you over there, you probably have like partial volume effect, some other, you know, uh, um, noise effect, but not inflow effect. So, um, yeah. So this is very unique, especially, you know, you have to place your last or first slice at a particular slice in order to catch the inflow effect. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Good, some good news for fMRI people. Um, right, uh, any other? Questions okay. for Inji? Molly, raise, raise your hand. Oh. Yeah, um, I, I looked at this a little bit in the past before I thought a huge amount about lags and certainly not using some of the tools that are much more advanced that you know we're talking about today. Um, but the, the idea that what goes in must come out within the skull, this uh, is it the Monroe Kelly doctrine of you can't have your head explode, right? Something has to go, um, but that, that concept has been linked to the presence of negative bold signals throughout the brain. And so I, I, you know, I wasn't the first to look at it. I think a lot of people saw negative reactivity um, and the cerebrovascular reactivity, uh, particularly around the ventricles. I saw it around large vessels. So in perivascular spaces where CSF stores, you know, the, the volume of CSF is changing because there is a, a big inflow of, of blood to the intracranial space. Um, but I mean, I, I tried to swing this as a positive because you can differentiate that from other negative fMRI signals because you can use this latency information. Um, so I, I think, you know, in, in this group of people where we're, we're thinking so much about these delays and the timing, um, the, the effect of these CSF changes on what looks like apparent bold signal changes, it has a different dynamic signature to what you'd see from sort of your classic deactivation or a negative bold from a neural origin. Um, so in a way, it's, it's a way of um, helping tease apart, the, the lag information can tease apart even within the, the signals throughout the, the cortex, white matter, gray matter, et cetera. So uh, I don't know. Could, could actually help people um, make a case of distinguishing signal variants. 
Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. Like the, the other thing which I dare now to touch is the negative ball signals. <laughs> there's a, so many, so many stories behind it that there's, you know, um, so I don't, you know, I, I think uh, maybe this question is not, you know, just uh, addressed towards me and this, we can just open this up to uh, uh, the, the discussion, you know, please feel free to, to jump in if you have any thoughts, you know, uh, um, we should just, you know, um, discuss. I, I, yeah, that's a good thought, Molly. I, I do not know there's a lot of things I, I couldn't wrap my head around. <laughs> you know, because yeah. we're, we're looking at a force ventricle, right? So that we can get info signal, but how that really, you know, associate with the periventricular uh, oscillation, like how can we detect that? Some people use like DTI to try to, uh, you know, sort of tease the, uh, a little bit on, on that front. But I, I do not have a clear thought on, on these type of thing yet. Yeah. And uh, Amy Skelton and uh, Todd Constable detected that in, uh, with their vaso back in the mid 2000s, uh, especially in temporal lobe, if I recall. So, depending on the volume fraction of the CSF, you can get anti correlated signals uh, for vaso too. So, uh, yeah, so if it's happening in vaso, presumably it is in the bold somewhere at some point. Yeah. Joe, you've got a question. Go ahead, mate. Yeah, um, can you help me understand, uh, so uh, I couldn't follow all of that, obviously, I'm not, <laughs> I, I couldn't either, <laughs> I'm not a physicist, right, but, but there's a couple of, uh, of issues that always confuse me, so there's, there's uh, pulse pressure uh, arrival, there's pulse pressure changes, and there's blood arrival time. And, and uh, they are quite different, you know, you can, well, I'm not going to go into, in, into the details, but uh, they could be markedly different. You can have several changes in pressure uh, that are conducted along the blood vessels in, in, uh, instantaneously, but the actual advance of blood along the blood vessel is a different story. Are you looking at these in, in some way that you can distinguish them? Uh, yeah, that's, um, you know, I, I said that pre, uh, all the people free, feel free to jump in. So from my point of view, that's the, the last slice or, or the second to the last slice, we sort of like do the, did the free transform of our CSF signal, right? So the, there's an open story about really what's the main driving force for the CSF for sure, but something is for sure that a cardiac pulsation definitely drives it. Uh, so the, there's a, you know, uh, some kind of a uh, 40 fold study that really measure pulse by pulse that the, the CSF being pushed up and down, you know, every cardiac pulsation. So, but what I try to understand in low frequency oscillation is I picture our brain instead of just pulsatile every second, like Joe, you know this very well, every second our brain basically pulsatile, right? So that will push the CSF. I always picture our brain is sort of like have this kind of a slow dilation at the low frequency oscillation. And this slow dilation is really uh, something uh, associated with the, associated with the uh, um, vessel dilation. So it, it really propagate with the blood. So your brain not dilate instantaneous everywhere is like really dilated, you know, uh, parts by parts. Uh, however, it's it just dilated very slowly, you know, and, and contract slowly. So this, I think, is the main driving force to really push the CSF in or out, which uh, I demonstrate is much bigger in terms of magnitude compared to the cardiac pulsation uh, push. So, um, and this could, could be vessel motion, could be something that really, so, so in my mind, as I said, I picture bring oscillates at different frequencies. Of course, at, you know, at heartbeat frequency, bring just oscillate and also at very low frequency oscillation. I also think bring oscillate, however, you know, a more, have a more special uh, spatial pattern, like also oscillate. Um, yeah, I don't I, know if that answers your question. I think also the, uh, I mean, the pulse wave velocity of the, the cardiac waveform is significantly higher than the bulk blood flow, right? So, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, you're getting basically a wave transitioning through the brain and that's going to probably have net, you know, no net motion. It's going to go forward, go backward. And that you know, it's just the AC component essentially. Uh, and then, you know, all of the, 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 the bulk flow that comes from the filtration of that through, you know, pressure modulation and maybe valves somewhere uh, ends up in the bulk flow, which is the low frequency uh, right. stuff. Yeah, my, there's my, there's yeah. also another frequency that uh, I think that you need to take uh, that probably advantage of is that when you breathe, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the cerebral uh, pressure, cerebral bunkers, the CSF pressure also has uh, a variability synchronous with breathing. Every time you inhale, uh, you draw out some, some blood and uh, the, the CSF pressure goes down. When you exhale, uh, it goes up. So there, there's, I think that there may be a way to exploit the fact that you have more than one uh, frequency when you do your fast Fourier. The frequency would be the same. We looked at that, right, Yunji? So, you know, um, you're talking about basically the thoracic pressure and the collapse of the, of the jugulars, et cetera, right? So you know that that's part of the Monroe Kelly doctrine, but that will be happening at the respiration rate. At essentially the movement of the chest, whereas what Yunji is measuring is delayed by several seconds and can only be explained by something in the blood, not by a mechanical effect. So I think you're right, the, the, the frequency is the same, but that there is a lag. So my, my sort of thought experiment for this um, may, or may, not, may, or may, may or may not be useful for people is imagine you're standing on the bank of a, of a, low, a slow flowing river, an estuary, and you've got tides coming in and out, you've got wind coming in and out, you've got waves rolling in and out. Your job is to stand there and figure out what the net flow of the river is as it vents into the sea. It's very, very difficult because all of these things are happening in synchrony. So, uh, so, so the bulk flow is one phenomenon. And, and I think um, I think the, the CSF or whatever, the, 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 the sort of balloon type nature of the brain, um, it, it's, it has a large effect and it, it, so it's a strong correlation. And the lag, I think, is what really makes us believe that it's not the prior explanations from David Feinberg or from the, the group in, I guess, Germany, where they were looking at thoracic pressure. I think that that lag is really important. See, the, the thoracic pressure, I would think, would be, uh, would help you separate out the difference between arterial pulsation and CSF pulsation, because the, the uh, respiration would have a much bigger effect on the CSF uh, pressure and would have very little effect on the arterial pressure. Uh, so I'm just making a suggestion, you know, that, that uh, it might help you isolate that CSF by subtracting off the arterial pulsations. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Joe. Um, so uh, actually, uh, I would like to move on a little bit to uh, ask our uh, panelists uh, for some, you know, uh, existing questions. Uh, I will hope we can cover as much as we can. And uh, uh, let me read some questions. So this question, I think, is more towards uh, Katie and, and maybe Tom. So um, some people ask about, um, so this is a more general question, like a waste, which uh, strategy for exper experimental design and analyze could be used to remove physiological signal without regressing out the neuronal activation of interest. So I guess I could start with one. Um, so I think that um, one of the methods that um, Tom had mentioned in his talk was a multi-echo uh, based methods. And I think that um, that's become a nice way of trying to disentangle what are the T2 star related effects from um, at least some of the classes of physiological noise, um, which aren't. So then we can try to like do an ICA like decomposition, but be able to, um, to, to sort those by whether their likelihood of being uh, T2 star effects. Um, of course, that doesn't um, handle all the kinds of physiology, like from uh, maybe the respiration volume, um, which are related to T2 star, but uh, that's, um, that's one approach. But uh, do you, did Tom want to add anything on that? Um, I would just add that, you know, if we had enough data and, and we could do it, you know, ideally, you know, what, what fMRI has been really lacking, right, is, is models, you know, that we can fit and, the, you know, and, and so a lot of it is just, we do a lot of correlational analysis and regressions and lots of interesting analyses, but, but oftentimes there's no model that we're trying to either prove or disprove. And, and it's very difficult. I mean, even in something as simple as the balloon models, which has been around for over 20 years is still being debated and, and there's, so, so I'm not saying it's easy, but ideally, you know, if that would be the holy grail, right? Absolutely. Uh, so next question is uh, addressed to Ben. So uh, if you mapped FA dependence box by box, so could you disentangle the bold versus inflow effect and 
both versus inflow effect and hence get idea of OEF, O2 usage by given neuron activation without need for calibration? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think if I go back to the multi-echo, you know, I mentioned VASO as a way to look at the arterial side, maybe multi-echo with at a low excitation flip angle is the way to get at the venous side with minimal uh, or lower um, arterial fluctuations. So maybe we have to first of all think about the sensitivity of the experiment pulse sequence. Uh, so then the question is, can you do something reproducibly? And I think for that, uh, I would not trust spontaneous breathing. I think we would need some sort of exogenous task, um, perhaps uh, even a respirate to drive things with a, ideally an aperiodic signal uh, so that we break up any pseudoperiodicity in the legs. Um, but I think we would need to do something like that before we would be able to answer that question. Okay, so um, so next, next question is for uh, Blaze. Um, so this is asked by Professor Asso. Um, thank you for the detailed illustration of your method. Did it ever occur to you that as alternative algorithm, maybe we can start with a template lag map or vascular structure to fit to individual 4D fMRI image? It may attenuate some methodological uh, controversies such as non-neuronal origin of low frequent systemic low frequency oscillation, though not interesting. Um, no, uh, not yeah. that interesting, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, I've, I've given that a thought. Uh, I, I think what you mean is to, uh, to break up the brain into vascular territories. Um, we, uh, yes, uh, I've been looking at doing that um, because I think that would, that would also get rid of some of the problems that we've been having with getting a, a good global regressor because things tend to be fairly consistent within a vascular territory, but the vascular territories in an individual seem to be delayed relative to one another. Um, this is a uh, basis of a work that we, we recently submitted to Mirror Image, which was uh, um, uh, not accepted, but we're, we're gonna rework it. There were some things that we hadn't, uh, we hadn't explained properly, but uh, we do find that there's a, a very strong correlation, very much stronger correlation within vascular territories than there is uh, between vascular territories. And in fact, you can differentiate uh, vascular territories based on inter-individual variation in the, in the lag maps. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a segment, segmenting by lag, uh, by, by vascular territory will probably make the method much more uh, robust uh, and it would help a lot in, uh, in especially subjects with pathological circulation because I think that it sort of gives you the, the opportunity of making something akin to a vascular fingerprint, you know, where you would say, you know, your left MCA, you know, for branch one, you know, the, 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 the anterior branch is delayed by half a second relative to, you know, norm and that's, you know, so many standard deviations out from the norm and, and perhaps that, that represents a problem. Uh, one thing we have seen is um, that the variation becomes very much more pronounced in older individuals, even perfectly healthy individuals than we would have suspected based on, for example, looking at the Kineptome project. Um, you know, 20 to 20, 22 to 35 year old healthy subjects have boring circulation. Um, you know, they, they're, everybody looks about the same. Um, uh, but once you get, you know, say to my age group, um, people are far more interesting in terms of what their circulation looks like. Um, I'm sorry, does that answer your question? So Gene has a question for me, but I'm going to punt it to Blaze. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm interested in that question as well, Ben, because yeah. it's kind of similar. Yeah, it's to a what technical I've been. question. So, so yeah. uh, Gene wants to know about slice timing. Correct. What do you want to ask live, Gene, or should I just read it? Oh. Yeah, please. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, you can go ahead. Should I repeat the question? Okay, um, yeah. okay so, so when it comes to, to mapping something like lag using correlation, and um, <clears throat> you, you typically don't acquire all the slices um, at close enough time to each other, but of course with uh, slice acceleration that might change. And so, and there are interactions with, with motion correction. So the understanding is that Maybe it's not the best thing to do those in steps. And so, what what is your what is what are your thoughts? Well, uh, slice time correction is absolutely necessary because you you absolutely see the slice times, the slice acquisition times. In fact, that's that's one of the first uh, uh, real proofs I had that Rapid was working properly. Is uh, you know I, I hadn't done slice time correction and I saw all these stripes 
And uh, in fact, they, they were the slice acquisition times. Uh, so that those are very easily picked out. In fact, we've used it a couple of times. Uh, Philips scanners, especially sometimes with the multiband sequences, is extremely hard to know what the slice time acquisition is because they don't put it in the header. So you just run rapid tide on the uncorrected data and then you can basically read it off. So, um, so yes, it, 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 it's, it's, it's necessary and it, it's, it's very easily measured. So are you saying as a follow-up, it says, it says you're saying instead of um, um, trying to input the slice times to, to actually let the data tell you what they were for no, no, I mean, simultaneous multi-slice? I mean, if you, if you know what the acquisition order was, uh, you should certainly use that and then that, that, that tends to help. And it does, um, you know, e even in, in the, um, uh, in the multiband data, you do you do definitely see the the effects of arrival time, and in fact, that was the basis for um, the happy technique that we developed for for mapping out uh, you know, for for deriving cardiac waveforms from the um, uh, from multiband fMRI data because you can actually you know the, the, those differentiations give you enough uh, enough sampling efficiency over the entire brain to be able to pull out the entire wave you know the entire cardiac waveform. Um, so, as to as to whether you should do motion correction or slice uh, time correction first, you know, I don't really have an opinion on that. I mean, you kind of have to do both for rapid tide to work properly, and and uh, I'm not sure if one order is better than another. So, sorry, but you had another you question. Tried. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I said okay. <laughs> okay. Um, any, so we're gonna jump to another round of questions. Uh, so uh, the next question is also for uh, Katie and Tom. Then some literature have shown that physiological signals were indirectly extracted from Y matter and CSF. However, recently there are some Y matter fMRI study. I think that there are some controversial, controversial to each other. What do you, uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so um, that's an interesting question because you know, we tend to, you know, as a field, regress out white matter CSF signals as as uh, as non neural. Um, but yeah, uh, John Gore and others have found that um, there's some interesting like structure in the white matter uh, that um, in functional connectivity maps and maybe some activation. So uh, potentially part of it is neural. Um, but we also know that there can be a strong physiological driver of these. Uh, such as with um, some of the autonomic effects I showed, which can um, have a kind of strong effect in the white matter um, and CSF as well. So um, if, if you regress things out, I guess, um, yeah, we would assume that like, if, if we're gonna use these as a regressors, um, ideally, then it only contains signals of no interest and not those of interest, but it's of course more complicated because there is potentially some uh, neural um, variance in those signals. Yeah, I would definitely concur with that. Um, so, I mean, I feel partly responsible because, you know, our, uh, Sharp as audio, our grad, the grad student from our lab came up with CompCore and now, and, and we never meant it for resting state fMRI. We meant it for task related fMRI where you could put some guardrails on the method by making sure it wasn't correlated with your task. Um, and, and so we felt it was okay to use it for task related fMRI. Uh, obviously, it's been very widely adopted for resting state fMRI, but I think the, the problem with CompCore is it's very sensitive to the thresholds and the polish, you know, what partial voluming you use and uh, what erosion you use. And that can make a big difference as to whether you're just getting, um, like if you really, sometimes it, they really do just represent, you know, the, the cardiac and the um, respiration, but sometimes you're gathering a lot of sort of these very low frequency fluctuations, which we still don't understand. Um, and, and then they much look much more like the global signal, um, which is why, you know, from, if you do physiological noise correction, you get your here. If you do global signal correction, you're here and you add white matter CSF, you're somewhat in the middle, depending, and you can slide back and forth, depending on what partial voluming and, and erosion parameters you pick. And, and there's no standard in the field right now. So, so I do think that is a, unfortunately a big source of variability in, in, in studies and, and a caution that people um, should pay attention to. Thanks, Katie and Tom. Um, actually- could some, that, could some of that be a steel phenomenon, do you think? The white matter is just 
playing second fiddle to the gray matter. So if you've got a task, especially, you know, uh, you know, the blood has to go to the neurons first or they shut down. Maybe the white matter is just getting the, the, the residual blood flow. Maybe it, in it, it can afford to wait for a few seconds to get its supply. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I'm not, I mean, it, it may be looking at the lag structure with the, and, and as some of the talks today did show, you know, sort of increased lags in the white matter. So I think um, that that is a good question to ask and, and, and maybe, you know, using lag structure more in our physiological regression is important. Um, I, I think the issue there, and, and at least in the old days, you know, using too many lags ate up your degrees of freedom very quickly. Uh, now with you know, shorter TRs and maybe that's okay, but uh, I, I think, yeah, that's something that needs to be revisited. Um, you know, before, you know, you couldn't afford to have more than 50 regressors or anything because, you know, then you don't have any data left, but now um, you could probably have 50 to 100 regressors maybe, but. Um, I mean, that, that was one of the motivations originally for going to the, um, the, 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 the way we're doing rapid tide now. And initially what we did is we just made, we made a copy of the regressor at every possible delay value, just regressed the whole kit and caboodle out. And we lost, you know, 50 or 60 degrees of freedom doing that. But if you have a single, you know, if you just have a single time course and you pick a single delay for it, then you, you don't lose as many degrees of freedom because you're, you're just regressing out a single uh, regressor instead of 50 every, in every voxel. So applying the appropriate delay helps a lot. And just to speak- do you, do you have to pick, do you pick the delay for each voxel separately then, or? Yeah, I mean, you, you generate that live delay map and then you generate a, a set of, you, you take the moving regressor and you delay it by that amount in every voxel and regress only that one voxel out of every box, uh, out of every time course. So I guess in terms of getting it into standard processing, there, there's there gotta be then, because there's so many multiple, you know, you're using the data so many times that then I guess every, you'd have to have enough sort of Monte Carlo simulations to sort of see how that would affect your analysis, right? Yeah, I mean, you have to calculate a significance threshold, um, certainly, although, uh, I mean, in the gray matter, you're usually above threshold, in the white matter, you're often below, but I mean, you, it's not, that's one of those questions, you know, if you're below the P of 0 0.05, that means you, you could be spurious, but it doesn't mean you are, right? I mean, because the uh, the values tend to be much, the, the correlation values tend to be lower because the blood flow is lower in the, in the white matter. But. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to think through, like, how, you know, like how to get this into the, you know, what would be the mainstream application? Because I, I mean, I think there's already so much controversy about the right processing and whether we're doing it correctly. And then there's the, all the clustering debate and P thresholds. And um, so, so it just adds one more complication. Um, okay, so then the, there's a question uh, to me. And um, the question is, do you think that intersubject variance could also be caused by different vascular density? Um, I, I do not know what you refer to. I think you refer to the, um, the variance between the delay, uh, between the um, derivative of a global mean signal versus the CSF inflow. If we talk about the variance there, actually the data, uh, I think you're right. I think this is really about individual um, vasculature in the brain because if you think the brain really is oscill you know, oscillating under this low frequency oscillation, then it really, uh, your blood vasculature actually dominate how the brain gonna oscillate because this low frequency oscillation is not like a positive motion that it affect all the brain at almost the same time. This low frequency oscillation actually propagates. So it basically affect different brain walks. So you can see the brain dilate at a different a part at different, a little bit different delay. So the brain not dilate simultaneously, it dilate you know, parts by parts. So in that sense, you know, you, um, you, you know, um, blood vascular does uh, decide how you bring slow dilation or slow contract, you know, what's the rate of that. And, you know, uh, so that will affect the coupling between that and the, the CSF. So, um, yeah, I hope that addressed the question. Um, and there's another, I think the question, uh, next question is for Ben. Have you ever tried to acquire high FA bold responses with flow compensation gradients to see if changing bold response arise from inflow effect or how can we make sure that they're from inflow effect? 
Uh, we haven't tried it. Uh, I'm not sure if they mean compensation or flow crushing. I have thought about flow crushing gradients. Remove the intravascular compartment because, of course, inflow is in intravascular. Um, it's too early to say yet. Um, I'd like to try those experiments, but um, we're still at the very basic uh, trying to figure out what effects are of things like multiband um, before we get too much into any any other um, variables in a pulse sequence. I'm trying to stay as close to standard as possible because we've got people running ongoing studies. They'd like to know what acquisition they should run. So I'm reluctant at the moment to try to introduce things like additional flow crushing or flow compensation. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out when people ask me, what should I do? <laughs> I can give them some guidance. Thanks. Uh, I think the next question is really addressed to, you know, um, maybe just follow up, you know, the Tom's comments about the statistic. So the question is uh, about who has tried to quantify the gain to fMRI detection statistic expected from modeling physiological inference in detail. So like what's the impact on the statistic when we you know, consider all these like physiological fluctuation and then denoise them? Um, any, any thought, Blaze or Tom? Uh, you mean the effects of the analysis so makes it better? <laughs> uh, see, we'll see. So you guys have you guys have modeled it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the things that we found is that um, uh, regressing out the correct regressor at the wrong time delay is actually a bad thing. Uh, and that was sort of a, a, one of the major findings of CDEM's paper is that the um, um, a lot of the spurious negative correlations that you, you get between regions is probably due to regressing out the global mean regressor, which is, as we say, very close to the SLFO in a, in a healthy individual. Um, if you regress it out at the wrong uh, time delay, then essentially if you, what you get with a, when you regress a low frequency signal at a delay out is you, you know, you, you know how you, you model a time shift by putting in a derivative. So that's, it's essentially equivalent to adding in a negative copy of the time delay at the correct, uh, of, the, of the global regressor at the correct delay. And so that's gonna generate the negatively correlated uh, uh, waveforms. And I think uh, hopefully Sina will talk about this more in detail tomorrow, but, um, uh, regressing things out at the, at the proper delay rather than just a, you know the, the, the delay of the global signal uh, really uh, suppresses the, the generation of the spurious negative correlations without really impacting the positive correlations that much. I mean, they decrease a little bit, but the negative correlations uh, decrease quite a bit uh, because I think in, in many cases, they're not real. They're just generated by the, the, by the regression process itself. Does that answer the question or do we know who asked it? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it was asked uh, some time ago, so I, I couldn't track, uh, track who asked it. Tom, do you have any comments about statistic impact from all these kind of a, you know, denoising or? Um, well, I mean, there's there's op one issue is obviously there's so many different denoising methods, and, right? Um, but I, I think it, it does depend. Like for task related fMRI, I mean, it definitely helps a little bit, but probably not as much as you'd like. So people tend not to do it if it requires a lot more effort. Um, for resting state fMRI, it, it, it obviously can change the results quite a bit. You know, if you look at the whole global signal regression controversy, um, definitely for fMRI starved methods like diffusion fMRI, it's absolutely necessary. Um, so I think if you're in a low SNR region, it, it definitely helps. And if you're in a high SNR region, it, it can help or not, depending on the application that speaks as in our experience add a tiny bit, um, I often see a lot of inter-individual variability in, term of how, in terms of how much effect these physiological models have. Um, sometimes, like, I guess it, it depends on what the, what the physiological state of that person is, and if they're taking a lot of deep breaths, et cetera, then you can have like a huge effect on their map. Um, but then some of them you don't see very much change, but then it turns out their physiology is really stable. And I guess that's a both effect, both um, a function of like what the person is doing as well as like how well our models fit that person. Um, so that's always, uh, yeah, something I've been thinking a lot about. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always the problem when you're doing denoising strategies. How do you, how, if you don't have ground truth, how do you decide what optimal is? I mean, do you just say, well, I decreased the variance by 3%? Well, great. Uh, you know, if I, if I apply a filter and I filter out my, my stimulus, I, I'll get the same. I will also decrease my variance by quite a bit, but not in a useful way. Um, 
So, I mean, sometimes for these things, maybe, you know, if we understood the system well enough to model it really well and simulate it really well, maybe that would be the way we would test it, but then you, you have to assume your model's correct. So. Yeah, the, the other approach that you could do is sort of a huge uh, result we had was if you give people caffeine, it just drives their system to, to a known state. And then like I, I had myself scan multiple times and, you know, mm -hmm. without caffeine, the, the result is variable from day to day and on caffeine, it's like just rock solid. So um, that's another approach you could take. Yeah. Not that I'm recommending that, but it's <laughs> an interesting tidbit. But, but we did, uh, uh, actually a couple of years ago, we did uh, uh, some interesting study on the My Connectome project. Actually, um, it was a scan of uh, uh, Russell Porek for like a year and then he, he's separate, he scans with uh, having coffee that morning and not having coffee. So we did find something interesting uh, on his, you know, uh, uh, coffee habit um, that reflects in terms, in terms of his blood flow. Um, and Yanis, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I have, I had a more sort of technical question. I, I've been thinking about um, um, uh, Katie's talk and basically the respiration and the cardiac signals. And I'm wondering if, I, I think I, I think I also read a paper that they were doing that. I think it was by Kolestani and colleagues where they sort of, they claim that in order to sort of get more robust um, CBR measurements, you sort of need to Orthogonal, orthogonalize the signal, the PET CO2 with the, um, uh, with, with the respiration and sort of the cardiac. So what, what is your opinion on, you know, in general? Like, I, I just feel like everything is sort of intermixed. And I'm wondering, like, if you, if you sort of had to design like a very good CVR experiment, would you sort of also include those two um, and sort of, you know, orthogonalize your CO2 to basically sort of remove the variance explained by those? Um, so this may be actually answered better by the people who've done more uh, CVR experiments. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of uh, interdependence of these effects, but um, yeah, I mean, maybe the best way is also not by resting state, but <laughs> by trying to control this more carefully too, and more I think about it, but um, Molly or others maybe have more um, better perspective on that. Yeah, Molly, please. <laughs> um, orthogonalization, it, it's not really a cure. It's just saying that anything two signals have in common, we are going to ascribe to one of them. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, is that any better or worse than randomly assigning the variance between the two of them? So I, I don't, I don't think orthogonalization is, is typically helping us. Um, I find if I have, if you have high collinearity between various signal sources that you're trying to differentiate, you have to change something about the, the data that you're trying to model and differentiate them in. So I, I, I don't know. It, maybe if you rephrase the question, I'm not sure if, if I fully answered it here. No, no, I, I, it was sort of more of a, I, I guess, you know, you sort of taps on a more sort of basic issue that I'm facing, which is, yeah, what if this sort of all these signals sort of relate to each other? And, you know, what is, I mean, obviously, like, as you said, like organization is just basically data manipulation. So um, I guess like I've seen a lot of cases where basically the signals are all related to each other, but they're sort of like put together into the same model um, and yeah, getting interpreted as. I mean, I don't, I don't think it necessarily gives you any more understanding. It just adds numerical stability. And, it know, just makes the regression, I guess, up. more numerically sound, but yeah. If, if you don't need to differentiate, then it's absolutely fine to have collinearity. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it touches back on what the, the previous question on statistics. I have no idea, particularly in task fMRI, I have no idea <laughs> if adding physiological regressors will increase or decrease the statistics of my um, task regressor and that part of the modeling, because so often physiology is collinear with some type of stimulus or task or, or aspect that is of interest. So, so I, I, I have no a priori um, prediction of what my statistics will do. Um, so it, yeah, it, it is all interconnected. And, and I think right, it, right, it's right. changing the experimental design of what you're doing to a person or having that person do to really uncouple them in the data so that you can stand a chance when it comes to modeling. 
This is why I don't like resting state. I would much rather. No, I mean, exactly. I was, yeah, I was thinking about like, yeah, exactly. I was also thinking about that. Like I want to frame another question about basically what, yeah, moving away from resting state may potentially do some kind of sort of more of a task-based uh, to sort of disentangle those. Yeah, no, that, um, but that answers my question. Thank you. Great. Uh, actually, um, as, a, as a moderator, I, I might have the pleasure to ask the last question. So um, allow me. So this question actually is for, I think for Joe and Molly probably. Um, so um, my own research, I use Resperac, right? So I give this kind of a um, step function of a CO2, right? 10 millimeter mercury above the level. Then uh, we clearly see this bold reaction to this kind of a step function of a CO2. Uh, but the thing is, if we remove using a high pass filter, remove this very low step function from the bold signal, we recover the low frequency oscillation, which is about 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 Hertz. So if I remove this kind of CO2, and I won't tell you, you will not think that both signal is from CO2 uh, oscillation. So it just looked like exactly like a resting state oscillation. And the funny thing is if I re we remove that the CO2 block from all the voxels, then we just left with this low frequency oscillation in every voxel. And then we can use blaze method to track the low frequency oscillation through the brain. And it seems like they flow a little bit faster, you know, when we do this on the same subject, when we do not give them CO2 in the first place. So that, that sort of like a tie to my hypothesis that, you know, the low frequency oscillation is something that happened to your blood vessel, which always there as long as you're not saturated blood vessel using CO2. So I just want to listen to you guys about you know, any comments on this, because I'm thinking maybe we can use low frequency oscillation, which is riding above the CO2, to really track how blood flow reach different voxels while using the CO2 away from to track how the, each voxel react to the arrival CO2. Like, you know, like Joe mentioned this morning about their different reaction curve, right? So to really separate, you know, what's the delay for the blood drive, to drive that point and what's the local reaction to the rival blood, the rival CO2? So to really separate them, is my question clear? Any comments on that? Or I have a follow up. Are you pegging the oxygen as well at the same time as the CO2, or is that varying? <laughs> The, the, this is this is a before uh, uh, Dr. Chen's. You know, I listened to Dr. Chen's talk this morning. That, now I'm gonna go back to redo everything with this, <laughs> with the O2 now. <laughs> okay. But no, this is just. Uh, I think we nailed O2 while just only let CO2 you know fluctuate. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, that's it's kind of reminiscent to the idea, I guess, of of re regressing out a, a task stimulus and still looking for resting state fluctuations and that you remove this big low frequency effect and you still have something you can sink your teeth into. And the fact that you see the lag change in what was a, an elevated hypercapnic state, um, it still is a hypercapnic elevated um, perfusion state. Uh, and, and you can see that change in the dynamics. That's quite cool. It's quite uh, satisfying. Um, I would expect that even smallish changes in baseline perfusion probably do manifest in some way in your residual oscillations. Um, there's still a lot of physiological things in your data. And so per, like in my, in my own experience, I have seen changes in the, the, the constrictive response to stimuli um, when you have an elevated baseline. I think there's a, a vast and slightly con conflicting literature on what an elevated baseline will do to task activation on top of that. Um, so it may be subtle, um, but you know how you want to probe the, res the remaining low frequency systemic oscillations, how you want to probe it. I mean, maybe, maybe what you're looking for does not change, but I would expect there to be some consequence to that elevated perfusion. Uh, despite the fact you've removed the effect technically in the, the bold contrast time series. Yeah, absolutely. They, they move faster. So that's the thing we found out that they, yeah, move, they, they move a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it just goes to show that the, the sort of fundamental assumption of the live mapping that we're doing, which is that the delay is constant over the length of the experiment, it, we know that's false. You know, it goes up and down. And especially in Yunji's experiments, you can see, you know, you give a block of carbon, of carbon dioxide, everything speeds up. Um, so maybe, over the course. Yeah. Maybe I can ask you a question then. You know, we do dynamic functional connectivity. How, how big of a window do we need to 
estimate these delays? And so how, how sensitive are we to some of the changes in these delays in terms of temporal resolution? That's a very good question, and I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's, um, that's one of those questions I, I, I've been trying to get a handle on. I mean, yeah. using cross-correlation methods that we've been using, um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't really have an idea of what our lower limit on the time resolution is. Um, you know, some of the stuff that Yunji's been doing with the carpet plot stuff, which is, you know, I, I don't know if you remember from my talk when I was talking about, you know, doing sort of visual peak, peak matching. Um, the nice thing about peak matching is that it's sort of a time domain method, is you can say this peak matches this peak. And you can actually see during the during the times when you've got the, the, the higher CO2, you can see the, uh, if you make a carpet plot, you can watch the, the slope of the carpet plot change um, as, as blood speeds up. So that lets you do things, you know, in a discrete section of time, you know, down to the resolution of whatever one of those peaks would be. Um, I don't have a good way of doing it right now. Uh, I've been I've been sort of hacking away at this in the background, trying to figure out uh, what works and what doesn't. But I don't have an answer for you. Uh, yes, it's a great idea. Yes, it should happen. You know, uh, I can't do it yet. Doesn't mean somebody else can't. So, uh, any any other comments? Um, I'm. Uh, you just yeah. yeah 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 uh sorry i'm surprised that uh you know you increase the uh pco2 and you can regress everything away and the the baseline is the same there there, there should be all sorts of changes but if you find that uh, you know that's that's really i think very interesting result it's not intuitive i wouldn't have predicted anything like that um I think that uh, for me, I'm confused about the differences between the changes that you see that are due to uh, vascular changes, the timing of the vascular changes, and um, the timing if you're looking at arrival time. Uh, I think I need to clear up my mind uh, if this is blood arrival time, because if you have CO2 in the blood and you change it, let's say you have a respirate, which I know you do, uh, you, you, can, you can have a little bolus of CO2 going there and you could theoretically at least trace that, the change through. Uh, you have two issues. You have the one, the time that it arrives and the time that the blood vessels respond. If you look at deoxyhemoglobin, uh, you don't need a vascular response for that. You can put a bolus through that, as in our bioarchive article, which is now coming out in MRM, uh, the article. Uh, you can put a deoxyhemoglobin bolus through that, and you can look at actual arrival time. Uh, and you can probably compare those. These, these are things that we haven't done. I mean, they're, they're open to everybody to do. Uh, we're certainly moving in that direction. We're going to do it. Uh, you can beat us to it if you like. That would be wonderful for us to, to see, uh, you know, to work on, on uh, to stand on your shoulders and do our stuff. Uh, so that, that's, that's my comments. I, I think that, that a lot of our, at least my confusion in all of this is the difference between the response time, arrival time, and I'm confused. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's the open-ended question. I, I'm not sure, you know, um, many of these questions do have an answer at this point, but that's why we have this kind of symposium to really, you know, poke the brains and having this question asked. Um, actually, in respect of time, uh, I would like to conclude. And, uh, um, you know, I hope everybody uh, really thank you for all the panelists and for your, uh, um, you know, great thoughts and contribution to this symposium. And I hope to see you uh, all tomorrow morning. And uh, uh, we have two, um, sessions tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, like today, and on the, the third day, we have the, uh, the workshop. Any, anything uh, you guys want to add? Okay, so um, good night, and uh, thank you thank very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, so. Good night. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Bye.